recognition of guests, the Honorable Premier. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to my colleagues for another day of debate in the legislature today, all of those who are tuned in watching us online and those who are joining us in the public gallery. I can see a couple of faces there of individuals uh, that I know, a couple of radio celebrities for sure, Corey Tremere, oh. <laughs> Darcy Campbell, uh, I see Susan Hartley from the still the King or the Three Rivers capital of Georgetown, I think we'll still call it that, and welcome. Uh, and our friend Mr. McDonald from the Food Bank, uh, thank you very much, and all those who are here. I can tell lots of stories about Corey and Darcy, but I won't today. Um, they're probably here in official business, so, uh, but welcome. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to say that uh, the Easter Seals uh, have announced their 23, 20, 2023 ambassadors yesterday. I want to congratulate twin sisters Megan and Caitlin Rogers. Uh, they're grade five students at Elliott River School, uh, daughters of Kevin and Andrea. Uh, we look forward to get to know them a little bit better as they begin to take on these important duties. Uh, and also wanted to say thank you, Mr. Speaker, to Veda Matheson. I would say uh, that Megan and Caitlin have big shoes to fill with Veda. She was a uh, uh, a great ambassador, and I'm sure she'll pass on all of the uh, tricks of the trade uh, uh, for this uh, for this coming pair as we look for uh, as we look for another good campaign for Easter Seals. I also wanted to offer my congratulations to Nicholas Herring, Mr. Speaker, uh, down in the southeast of Prince Edward Island, who uh, recently won the Atwood Gibson uh, Writers Trust Fiction Prize for his debut novel, Some Hellish, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Nicholas is a writer and a carpenter, Mr. Speaker, from Murray Harbor. Uh, and uh, that's a tremendous start to a writing career, uh, one that seems to be off to a much more prolific career than my own, Mr. Speaker, so, uh, so good for him. Uh, uh, he's, it, it's about a lobster, some hellish is about a lobster fisher uh, who struggles uh, with his existence, Mr. Speaker, something maybe that someone like you who fished for so long could relate to. So uh, according to the author, uh, fishing is the perfect metaphor for everything, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure we could agree to that. Sounds like a great Christmas gift, so congratulations to uh, Nicholas. I also wanted to say congratulations to uh, to George, Mark, and Melody Beck for 90 years, Mr. Speaker. The great business down in Montague, Storton Beck Limited, uh, is celebrating a very important anniversary. So many great memories of being there with my father, and I talk to George often about the times and tribulations of running a small town store in rural Prince Edward Island through many difficult times, and uh, George was certainly good to my father, my family, and to me, Mr. Speaker, so all the best to that family, and I wish them 90 more years of success. Uh, finally, Mr. Speaker, uh, Today is uh, Giving Tuesday, which is a day where people are encouraged to be kind, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and if you're able to make a donation to a charity of your choice, uh, uh, given the time of year, that would be appreciated. So I'll make a deal with the opposition. You'll be kind, Mr. Speaker, today. <laughs> and I will make a sizable donation to my friend Myron Yates at Big Brothers and Big Sisters, Mr. Speaker, and we'll get off to a good start. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition, I'd like to hear what you have to say. It's always hard to follow the sweetest Premier in Canada. <laughs> That's so calm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I too would like to start by, by welcoming uh, some of the folks in the gallery. I, mean, I see Darcy Campbell, I see Corey Tremere, who provides me with a, sometimes a smile, sometimes a moment to ponder in the morning. He always puts up a really thoughtful tweet, and, uh, and I look forward to that, actually. I'm sorry, a lot of things on Twitter I don't look forward to, but, but I do look out for Corey's thoughts every morning, and, and they're lovely. And Mike McDonald, of course, from the, from the food kitchen here. Lovely to see you all. Um, as well as Susan Hartley, who is the president of the Island Green Party, and I think beside her is Boyd Allen underneath that mask. Lovely to see you, Boyd. Welcome to the uh, legislature. I think first time you've been here this sitting. Uh, the Premier, the sweet Premier, talked about the 10-year-old twins, Caitlin and Megan Rogers, who talk about sweet. Uh, you know, a wonderful, beautiful set of twins from Cornwall, who, of course, have been chosen as the 2023 Easter Seals Ambassadors. And their motto is, believe in yourself and don't give up. And uh, it's a lovely motto, and I, I think one that we can all embrace. Uh, I also want to, and I think the Premier mentioned, the sweet Premier mentioned uh, Veda Matheson, that's three, three donations so far, <laughs> Premier. Veda Matheson, who was the Easter Seals ambassador for three full years, um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, mostly, mostly due to COVID. And Veda was just 
you know, she was so wonderful in the job that she did. And as the Premier said, the sweet Premier, Caitlin and Megan have a big, some big shoes to fill. Um, I know that Caitlin and Megan are, you know, they were inspired by Veda and the work that she did, but they're also, they're, they're involved in dance lessons, they're involved in wheelchair basketball, and I understand they're really awesome little singers. They love to do karaoke. So I, maybe we'll get to see some of that um, uh, along the way. They take their, uh, they make their first public appearances officially in the new year, and then of course in April they'll embark on that tip-to-tip -tip Easter Seals PEI school tour. So I wish Caitlin and Megan and their parents, uh, Andrea and Kevin, all the best as they embark on this really exciting journey and, and uh, adventure. Closer to my own home, Mr. Speaker, this coming Saturday night, the Argyle Shore Women's Institute are going to host their fourth annual Christmas tree lighting event. And it's a beautiful event at the Argyle Shore Community Centre. It takes place uh, on from 6 o'clock till 8 o'clock, I think, this Saturday. And the, as always, it's, it's a lovely, warm affair. You see it in small rural communities all across Prince Edward Island. There'll be popcorn for the kids, movies, hot chocolate. Um, and this year they're doing, and I've seen this in a few, uh, a few Christmas events now, an in-memory fundraiser um, gives you an opportunity to remember a loved one by hanging a memorial ornament or a light or something on a tree. And that, they're going to do that for the first time this year. So it's a lovely little addition to so many Christmas traditions which are happening across the province. Uh, I hope everybody has a great week here in the legislature, and I'm really looking forward to this kind day ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I guess I better say something nice about the Premier. <laughs> You're a pretty nice Premier, and we have a, we have a pretty friendly uh, Leader of the Opposition. And, of course, all members of this Legislative Assembly oh, are very pleasant to deal with. Nobody can do it better. I'd also like to welcome everyone to the gallery, our radio celebrities and Mike McDonald and all our other special guests. Also say hello to everyone back in the Evangeline Muscush District and all Islanders. Mr. Speaker, as was mentioned earlier, today is Giving Tuesday, and it is a good day to uh, remind ourselves, you know, to say hi to an elder or uh, be nice to our neighbours or do, do a, a gesture of kindness to someone that could probably lift up their day. Also, Mr. Speaker, we too in Muskush have uh, an annual celebration this time of year, and it's Thursday night at 6.30 in the, in the churchyard. We light up a Christmas tree, and it's called Home for Christmas, and it's a fundraiser as well, but it's in memory of uh, our loved ones that have passed on, and it's something that's done every year, and I want to thank Robin Gillis and the Gillis family and the fire department for their initiative to do this. They set the tree up on Saturday, and I was going to go over and watch, but it was raining, so I thought I'd stay home. <laughs> anyway, normally I help, but I just didn't feel up to going over on Saturday, but thank them and uh, all parishioners. I hope you have a wonderful evening Thursday night. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we've heard, Giving Tuesday, um, global movement to unleash the power of people to, and also to offset the consumerism of Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Um, despite the ask for everybody to be kind, I'd also remind people that giving comes from the heart, and altruism is giving without needing to have something in return. Um, and so giving can be money, it can be volunteering, it can be fundraising for others, it can be an act of kindness. Um, and this is a time to think about you know, who it is and where we want to give, not just now, but all year. So I'm particularly keen on, on a way that we can fundraise that keeps the, the um, support going all year round. The Upper Room has, um, and the Food Ministry has a campaign to do a weekly donation, and so does Blooming House. Um, and so those are the two that I'm going to be supporting in the coming year with a weekly or a monthly donation. Um, and Mr. Speaker, I'd encourage everybody else to do the same. Stratford Capic. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure for me to rise today and, and bring greetings um, to the residents of, uh, of the Stratford area. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, say a special hello to uh, three very special ladies in my life. Uh, my mother-in-law, who I love dearly, Doreen McPhee, um, Alice Pickett, and Shirley Cleveland, who are residents at uh, St. John's House. They uh, are um, probably two of my greatest um, um, confidence uh, with regards to what's happening in the Stratford area, and uh, I, I always rely on their, on their sage advice. 
Mr. Speaker, I'd also be remiss if I didn't recognize some of the individuals that have joined us here in the gallery today. Uh, Mike McDonald, of course, who lives over in my district, and Mr. Corey Tremere. Uh A lot can be said about Corey being a radio personality, and uh, I also, like the leader of the opposition, uh, look forward to his tweets every morning. Uh, but in, in uh, addition to Corey, there's a, a very, very powerful person uh, behind Corey, uh, beside Corey, in Corey's life, and that would be Autumn Tremere. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Autumn uh, back when I was in cabinet. Uh, she was my, my calmest person in health, and uh, I just I couldn't begin to say enough of great things about Autumn, Corey, and their entire family. You 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 set the bar as far as uh, what a family should be and how to present yourself. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, on Saturday past, I had the extreme pleasure, along with the uh, Honourable Member from Mermaid, Strat Mermaid Stratford, and apparently the uh, Leader of the Opposition now, to uh, attend the Crossroads Fire Department Long Service Awards. Um, I don't know if she read the program, but uh, she, she received a, a pretty significant uh, promotion on Saturday. <laughs> I'll send you a copy. <laughs> But Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, we're, we're very blessed in Stratford, uh, an area to have such a great, great group of volunteers and, and uh, families that support these volunteers. Uh, the men and women that make up the Crossroads Fire Department are to be commended, as are all volunteer firefighters across uh, Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. And in particular, Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, uh, Volunteer Firefighter of the Year uh, award went to Billy McPhee. And I also want to recognize a very, very special first-time uh, recognition uh, from the board of the Crossroads Fire Department went to uh, Don Helpelman. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to all of our volunteers. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know um, I was at the same dinner, obviously, as uh, the, minister, or the uh, member across, and, and uh, <laughs> you never know what's going to be printed in a program, I guess. So when you get there, you go with the flow. Um, I'd like to say hi to everybody that's in the gallery today. Thank you. It's great to see you all today. And um, hi to everybody in, in uh, Mermaid Stratford and um, to my colleagues. So I was also, uh, as I mentioned, at the dinner for uh, the Crossroads Fire Department, and it was such a great evening full of laughs and, you know, sharing those little nuances that all of the members uh, go through. They're a pretty tight-knit community. And the service pins that went out was astounding. And everywhere from five years up to 40 years of service. And uh, Billy McPhee and Ricky Sentner from my district were both honored with more than 40 years of service pin, which is really astounding. They were there, they were there the day that it was decided to um, start the uh, Crossroads Fire Department, which is amazing. And, and uh, so I'd also like to mention the Women's Institute dinner was on Friday, and what a great turnout that was, and an amazing effort by the Women's Institute, and a uh, great fundraiser. That all went to Western Hospital and the Community Hospital of O'Leary, and I had the pleasure of sitting with the uh, Western Hospital auxiliary members, who, Mr. Speaker, I will tell you, they sold their cake. They made a war cake and it sold for $510 in their auction, in the cake auction, which was amazing. Anyway, and with that, I will say have a great day, everyone, and I look forward to the proceedings today. Thank you. John Bowman, Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's certainly a pleasure to rise today. Welcome back to all my colleagues. Hello to everybody watching in District 9. A special hello to my parents who are watching my six, six-year-old today. So I do appreciate it, Mom and Dad. Thank you, and I love you. Um, also, I want to recognize some of our guests here today. Thank you for joining us here in the gallery. But we have Corey and Darcy and Mike McDonald, of course, and uh, as well, Barb Ramsey, a uh, counselor from Summerside. Thanks, thanks for being here. I know uh, the Hot 105.5 food drive is certainly well on its way, as well as the Ocean 100 Toys for Tots drive and so thanks for everything you're doing for for island families here especially during the holiday season and mr speaker i just want to echo some of the comments uh, t that were said today just around um caitlin and meg and rogers mr speaker i had the pleasure of meeting them yesterday and they are going to be incredible uh, Easter Seals ambassadors. You could just see the light in their eyes yesterday, and I'm really looking forward to getting to know them over the next year. And of course, Beta Matheson, um, I've said it here before in the House and, and so many times over, 
Veda is magical in every way, and I wish her all the very best. I know she's going to be an incredible mentor for um, both Caitlin and, and Megan. And finally, Mr. Speaker, today is the PEI Business Women's Association Symposium. I was able to take part in their opening ceremonies this morning, and we are just so lucky to have such strong business women leaders in our province, and I really do wish them all the very best in today's events. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise uh, a few days late with proper pink shirt and purple tie. I realize that violence against women is an issue important to all men. Violence against women is just not just an issue for other people. Every wife, daughter, grandma, or granddaughter is at risk or already have experienced violence, and it's up for us men to do something about it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise today and say hello to the folks in the gallery, including uh, Summerside City Councillor Barb Ramsey. Hi, Barb. It's good to see you. Um, so I had the pleasure of attending the holiday home tours this weekend at Lot 16 Hall, which was a lot of fun. Fudge was great. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to just mention a couple of other uh, events that are coming up at the hall this Christmas season. So this Saturday, um, they are having pet photos with Santa. So you have to book your appointment in advance, but you can bring your pet to the hall, get a photo with Santa. It's usually dogs, I'm not going to lie, but if you have other pets, I'm sure they'd be open to that. Rabbits, cats, you know, Santa loves all pets and appreciates that uh, people have uh, pets as part of their family, so we, we love Santa for that. Um, as well, um, we have a Christmas concert coming up on December 11th with Kim, Albert, and Faces, so that'll be a lot of fun too. Uh, lots happening at Lot 16 Hall, and I hope you'll check it out. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Member from Charlottetown Winslow and the government way. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise. Of course, uh, recognize uh, some of my former colleagues, uh, Darcy Campbell from Hot 105.5 in the Morning Hot Tub, and uh, my good buddy Corey Tremere from uh, Ocean 100, as well Mike McDonald and Brad Ramsey. And I just wanted to uh, welcome you uh, publicly, and also just wanted to say a big congratulations, Mr. Speaker. The SEDMA uh, hockey tournament was taking place this past weekend in Halifax with a lot of island teams. Saw a few Central Storm team banners coming home back to PEI as well as some Mid Isle Wildcats. So just want to congratulate all the girls on a great weekend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Did I miss anyone? Couldn't have. <laughs> Y'all must want to get on the radio and you're long-winded today. <laughs> member statement. The Honorable Member, the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Like many islanders, I love walking on our beaches. It's an essential part of life here on Prince Edward Island. And I think if somebody were to introduce a law that said we could no longer do it, there would be an absolute revolution. But thankfully, we do have laws that make sure that all 1,100 kilometers of our island beaches are accessible to everybody. At least that's the way it used to be. We all know that people break laws, Mr. Speaker. It happens all the time. But at least when those people are found out, justice typically prevails. It is through people's confidence in our laws that the rules make sense and that they are just and that they are fairly and consistently applied that the glue of society holds tight. That's why it is so alarming that many islanders' confidence in our laws and in this government's desire to uphold them has been deeply shaken. We now know that this government is completely unconcerned about major developments going ahead without permits in place. In Fairview, for example, not a single permit was issued from multiple departments for a major development. And there was no consultation with a municipality that is on the very brink of bringing in its own official land use plan. No permits, no discussion, no public consultation, nothing. And this government just shrugs it off, or even worse, it defends what is going on. It's, all, it's almost unbelievable, Mr. Mr. Speaker, except that it's really happening. And in Point de Roche, <laughs> you want to demolish a heritage building? Sure, there's a permit for that. You want to build something within the setback area in the buffer zone that's twice or three times the size of the previous structure? Sure, there's a permit for that. You want to bring in thousands of tons of armor, rock, and dump it on the beach blocking public access? Sure, there's a permit for that. It sometimes seems that it would be almost impossible for the new landowners to actually break any of our province's laws, given this government's willingness to grant permits without question. 
or more likely, no permits were ever issued in the first place, mm -hmm. since that appears to be this government's preferred way of doing business. Islanders are shocked and disgusted by this government's casual attitude and by their complete lack of concern about protecting our beautiful island from harmful and haphazard development. Islanders need a government that will stand up for them, that stands firm and says, take that monstrosity away here, here. and give us back our beach. Thank you, Mr. Oh. Dignitas Pomerol, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. For the past five weeks, I've been questioning the Minister of Health and Wellness about the house of cards that is presently rural health care in this province. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the last five weeks, I haven't received one answer from the Minister mm -hmm. as to why he's allowing the constituents that he represents and all rural islanders to be treated as though their lives are less important because of where they choose to live. Every answer he provides blames the previous administration, promotes initiatives that have no noticeable impact on our health care system, or lets on that this is the first time he's hearing about the horror stories that are happening in his own backyard. Mm. West Prince constituents are seen through the oblivious nature of this minister, as evidenced by an email that I will table today, one of many that I have received. Here is a quote from an email by a constituent whose mother had to sit in an emerge for the night because they would not sign the DRN paperwork for admission to the O'Leary Hospital. And quote, in October, I met with our Minister of Health to discuss issues surrounding health care. One of the issues I asked about was the DNR policy at Community Hospital O'Leary. So imagine my surprise when watching the November 25th sitting of the legislature and Minister making it sound like it was the first time he had heard about this, end quote. Mr. Speaker, this is beyond appalling and disrespectful to the people he sits in that chair and is supposed to represent. The Minister and the Premier have accused me on multiple occasions of playing politics when it comes to health care in our province. To that, I say this. If playing politics means that I have to, that I'm standing up to ensure that islands across this province are not forced to choose between signing their right to live away to get a hospital bed, if it means advocating for the doors of our rural hospitals not to be locked when people need them, or if it means making sure it won't take an ambulance two hours to get to an emergency in Tignish, then, Mr. Speaker, I'm guilty as charged. And I'm not stopping. Yeah. This ministry needs to stop living in the past and fix the problems of the present. And on behalf of my constituents and yours, shame on you, Minister, shame on you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and with your indulgence, I would like to recognize some people in the gallery today. Um, I'd like to welcome Darcy Campbell and Corey Tremere, both members of the Saltwire uh, management team, st sorry, Stingray <laughs> management team. <laughs> I'd like to welcome Mike McDonald, the executive director for the PEI, the Upper Room Food Bank uh, and Soup Kitchen, and Susan Hartley and uh, Boyd Allen, who are here representing the Montague Food Bank today. Um, and also, I'd like to welcome Barb Ramsey and Matthew Murphy back with us again today. Islanders are struggling to make ends meet, and never is that more obvious than as we head into the holiday season. And with inflation, this year is worse than ever. Food bank usage is up significantly. Mike McDonald of the Upper Room Food Bank and Kitchen reported that the months leading into summer saw a significant increase in the number of clients. The month of May 2021, as compared to May 2022, saw a 40% increase. They normally see that jump in numbers as we enter a school year or going into the winter months, so this is significant. While the need increases, the budgets for giving naturally shrink. And that is why I'm thrilled to announce that the Hot Holiday Food Drive is back in Prince Edward Island from November 28th until December 2nd. The following is when and where you can drop off your donations. Monday at Spring Valley Building Centre in Kensington, yesterday. Today, Tuesday, at the Credit Union Place in Summerside. And that's where Tannis Bruder is today. That's why she couldn't join us. She will be uh, broadcasting live from there this afternoon and at every location this week. Wednesday, you can drop off at Founders Food Hall and Market here in Charlottetown. Thursday, at Mike and Andrea's Snow Frills in Stratford. And Friday, at the Royalty Crossing and Superstore. If you are not able to make it in person and would like to donate, you can send an e-transfer to fundraiser at hot1055fm.com. All funds and donations raised will be donated to food banks across PEI. 
I would be remiss to miss this opportunity of thanking all the other amazing community initiatives happening to support families for the Christmas season. I will name a few. This is, I'm going to exclude some, but I'll name a few. CBC's Feed a Family and Turkey Drive happening November 28th to December 16th. Lions Clubs Island Wide, Gifts from the Heart, Ocean 100's Toys for Tots, Santa's, Santa's Angels, For Love for Care, who are providing free hot meals this Christmas day, just to name a few. I encourage everyone to help where and when they can. Thank you, Hot 1055, for caring about your community, and I hope from the bottom of my heart that this is the most successful food drive yet, mm -hmm. as the need is great, and we want all Islanders to have food and to feel the love that comes from having stocked shelves. I hear many families this year who have decided to forego gift giving and instead of drawing names this holiday season, as a family they plan on making a donation to a food bank. To them, I say thank you as well. If you are able to give, please do so and help Hot 1055 in their quest to fill the PEI food banks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of member statements. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Mr. Speaker, on November 25th, the Honourable Member from Summerside Wilmont asked questions about policies related to absenteeism in schools and alleged a reluctance of child protection services to investigate cases of absenteeism in schools. Mr. Speaker, there is no reluctance. Child Protection Services investigates any report of absenteeism that could be related to neglect or abuse. Any child protection report where a parent is preventing a child from attending school or not providing them with the necessary skills, tools, services to attend school would meet the criteria for an investigation. I understand there's a working group led by the Department of Education and Lifelong Learning, which a staff from Child Protection Services participates in. The working group did establish a comprehensive list of initiatives to encourage attendance and engagement within the school system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Anyone else? No? For our first question, I'll call on the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Last week I asked some questions about a child care centre in the Surrey area that is in imminent danger of closing permanently. And I also talked about one in my own area where the infant program had to be closed down last Friday. In responding to my questions, the Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning said that, and I quote, there's a number of different grants that we've been rolling out, end quote. And so my first question surrounds these initiatives, a question to the Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning. Do any of the measures that you listed that day provide low interest loans for capital expenditures, which is actually what's urgently needed in both of these cases to stop these centres from closing? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, um, Official Leader of the Opposition Party, for, for raising the concern. Um, certainly, I, I recognize um, the challenges associated with um, infrastructure needs for, for child care centres, and that's precisely why I have been advocating with the federal government. But certainly, as a province, too, we are looking at um, various options in terms of low interest um, financing. I have been working with my colleague beside me on some possibilities moving forward, so I do look forward to being able to announce those. Um, sooner rather than later, hopefully. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. John, the leader of the official opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Well, it absolutely needs to be sooner rather than later. We yeah, have yeah. one daycare centre on the verge of closing. We have one that desperately needs to find a new location exactly. within the next few months. So I hope you're doing more than looking into this, Minister. This needs, this needs to happen right now. Among the programs listed by the Minister last week for centres like the two in question, which are both privately run, was, and again I quote, capital grants to support renovations or purchase equipment. Mary Poppins, the child care centre in my area where the infant program closed last week, needs to relocate by the middle of next year or they're going to be forced to close as well, leaving close to 100 families without child care options on the South Shore. Question to the same minister. This capital grant that you mentioned last week, is it sufficient for the capital needs of the owners of Mary Poppins who absolutely have no choice but to relocate? Uh, Mr. Education, Mr. 
Speaker, uh, in partnership, as the Honourable Member knows, in partnership with the federal government, we are investing heavily within our early childhood sector, Mr. Speaker. We have seen a number of success stories whereby new centres are opening in rural settings, Mr. Speaker. I know the staff have been in touch um, with Mary Poppins on several occasions last week, and they are working to find some solutions for Mary Poppins. The last thing we want to see is a childcare in a rural setting closing, or, or um, because recognizing again, in order for for folks to, I mean, in order for any of us to be here today who have small children, we need childcare. We need uh, reliable childcare, Mr. Speaker. So we are going to do everything we can to support Mary Poppins in achieving uh, this relocation, Mr. Speaker. And I look forward to further conversations with the, the leader of the opposition party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the official opposition. Thank you. I, I noted in the minister's opening greetings that her parents are looking after her kids. How lovely, but how lucky you are to have that option. Not every island family does. And as you say, without childcare, people are unable to carry on their lives, to go to work and pay their bills. I've received many emails and calls over the last few days about the potential closure of Mary Poppins, and one of the asks in those emails is for this provincial government, not the federal government, but the provincial government, to provide a low interest loan for capital expenditures. In the case of Mary Poppins, this is going to amount into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're not asking for a grant, they don't want a handout, all they want is a loan, an extremely low risk loan that would ensure that childcare is maintained in the South Shore area. To the same minister, you keep mentioning this federal program that's coming sometime in the future, but these childcare centres need help now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is your department not stepping up with the low interest loans that these centres desperately need to stay in operation? Education, lifelong learning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wow. Speaker. We are investing, Mr. Speaker, in our early childhood sector, Mr. Speaker, and I'm aware that Mary Poppins has received previously a grant, Mr. Speaker, and that's precisely why we, the department is working with Mary Poppins, and we are going to ensure their success, Mr. Speaker, and I know my colleague beside me, we are looking at various loan options for Mary Poppins, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I just want to remind the House what this government has done for early years. Uh, in the last two years, Mr. Speaker, we've reduced parent fees to $20 a day, Mr. Speaker, from $30 $36 on the high end, Mr. Speaker. We've increased, on average, our um, wages for early years workers by 23%, Mr. Speaker. So despite what the uh, Leader of the Opposition is saying, we are investing and we are committed to the early years sector and we will continue to work with Mary Poppins on the way forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I, yeah, for seven years I've been working with Helen and Neil to secure the future of Mary Poppins that this minister is so concerned about. They have staffing issues, they have issues permanently re uh, related to relocation, and they have trouble with financial viability because it's such a heavily regulated field. The other challenges faced by both centres is in attracting staff, one of the things I just mentioned. The restrictive rules that qualify, uh, that allow people to qualify on the wage group for childcare centres, and how an individual with a master's degree and many years of experience currently only qualifies for minimum wage. The minister told me to bring back this specific situation to her personally, but I know that Mary Poppins has approached the minister on multiple occasions about yes, this so without exactly. success. Yeah. To the same minister, I'm really not interested in finding fixes for individual cases that are really nothing more than symptoms of a dysfunctional system. I want you to fix the pay grid. Minister, when are you going to do that? Mr. Speaker, and despite it taking a couple weeks, I'm glad that the legislation around early years uh, did pass last Friday, Mr. Speaker, and, and some of the challenges that the Leader of the Opposition is addressing today around uh, the wage grid will be addressed in the regulations, Mr. Speaker. And again, I just want to advise the House that some of the, around some of the investments we've actually made in early years, Mr. Speaker, I look at the increase to wages and staff, Mr. Speaker. We are rolling out a defined contribution pa pension plan, Mr. Speaker. We provided education grants. Mr. Speaker, a return to the ECE profession grant, Mr. Speaker, one-time retention grants, innovative retention practice grants within rural settings, Mr. Speaker, and the list goes on and on and on and on, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm not sure the minister recognizes just how tone deaf that response is to the thousands of kids. 
the, the imminent closure, the imminent closure of the two centres that I've been talking about will have a devastating effect on an already challenged system, and they are only two of many centres that are in danger across this province. Myself and my colleagues receive emails and calls every week from parents, mostly mothers, I should say, who, despite their best efforts, have not been able to secure childcare for their children. These women are from all over our province. Mm -hmm. And the desperation you can hear in the voices of these parents is heartbreaking. If they cannot find childcare, then they can't work. And if they can't work, they can't pay their bills. A question to the same minister. The list for childcare spots has gone from 1,500 to 2,000 under your watch in the last two years. Clearly, your current approach is not working. How are you going to turn this around? Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I, I just want to take a moment to recognize the outstanding staff within the department who are tuned in today, Mr. Speaker. And I know they have been working diligently on this file, and we are so appreciative of their work as well as the partnership that we've had with the federal government, Mr. Speaker. So, as I've said before in this House, Mr. Speaker, Canada is leading the way in childcare, Mr. Speaker. I met with the federal um, uh, federal minister a month ago, and this is precisely what she said: the PEI is leading the way, Mr. Speaker. I recognize that we still have have challenges. Currently, currently, we've met our federal targets. We're at 62% of, of, of childcare spaces of, of, on the island here with 4,444 spaces across the board. In the last two years, Mr. Speaker, we've been able to increase the number of childcare spaces by 443 spaces. In the last year and a half, Mr. Speaker, that is significant. And we're not stopping now, Mr. Speaker, and that is precisely why we're going to continue that relationship with the federal government. And I just want to applaud all the staff with the department, BCDA, everybody who's working so hard. Summerside Wilmot. Response that parents get when they reach out to say there's a problem, that everything's great, it's no wonder people follow up with us after they've contacted you. Mr. Speaker, Norbert Carpenter told us last week that school absences across the province are at 13 percent. Obviously, that's a number that's quite high. And with so many students already feeling the impact after the last couple of years, I worry about this, what this means for kids who are missing even more school days and for teachers who are already overworked. To the Minister of Education, what are you hearing from teachers about their ability to complete their lesson plans this year if numbers continue like this over the winter? Education, lifelong learning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And certainly this was a concern right at the very onset of, of um, the, the pandemic. And that's why the department has revised the curriculum to reflect some of the, the changes in, in um, learning gaps and benchmarks in that, Mr. Speaker. We understand this is not ideal, Mr. Speaker. We want our kids to be in the classroom. That being said, our absenteeism rate, yes, it's around 13% currently, but we have a lot of substitutes in place. Our, no, our The PSB as well as the CSLF, they um, engaged in some strong recruitment efforts over the summer. And we have a lot of subs there to support our students and our staff. And Mr. Speaker, I know I've already said it in the House, but Mr. Speaker, we added significant amount of frontline staff within our schools this year in our, through our operating budget. We went back to Treasury Board in, at the end of the summer and we added more. And then this last month, we added more again, Mr. Speaker. We're here to support the school system and we'll do whatever we can to, to support our staff as well as, as our students. Thank you very much. Even with these revisions, I'm still hearing from teachers who are constantly needing to catch kids up because how many of their students are out each week? And it's putting them behind. We've been raising the need for increased support staff in schools for years. To the Minister of Education, how does the number of support staff in island schools, in island schools compare to the actual need in island schools? Education and lifelong learning. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to applaud all of our school staff within our schools, Mr. Speaker. They do an incredible job, and these have been extenuating circumstances the last year, the last couple of years especially, with COVID, with Fiona, Mr. Speaker, and that's precisely why we've invested in our education system, because this government feels that education is the best investment this government can make, Mr. Speaker. So again, looking back at the 2022-2023 operating budget, we added 40 more frontline staff, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Mr. Speaker, again, we went back in the summer and just this past month to add more, Mr. Speaker. Our staff are constantly in touch with the, uh, the staff on the ground within the schools, Mr. Speaker, and we'll do whatever 
whatever we can to support them. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Side, Walmart. Mr. Speaker, it's great to applaud school staff, but I would encourage the minister to actually listen to them. Mm -hmm. Because one message I'm getting loud and clear from the folks who work in the school system is that there are simply not enough supports in place to do what they need to do. We had one school highlight for me that their actual need for EAs, as an example, is 30, but their allotment was nine, yeah. right? And when a student is out for a whole week, they need extra help to get caught up, and teachers need support to do this. Mm -hmm. We could use more supports in virtually every category across the board. To the education minister, what additional supports are you providing teachers to get them through this wave of Ill illness that is impacting our schools right now? Education and lifelong learning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I agree that our, our staff, they need the supports themselves. They need, they need to be well to, to be able to teach and um, be there for their students in the classroom. Mr. Speaker, there's been a high degree of, of um, uh, PD this year, Mr. Speaker, especially around social emotional learning. Um, we, we certainly recognize the importance of social emotional learning and the mental health and well-being of our students, especially following the pandemic. So we have, uh, we have engaged with additional PD. We have um, a social emotional consultant within the department. We have four new mental health um, consultants that are working across the, the, the school system, Mr. Speaker. And again, all these additional staff to help support our school system and our students. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure additional supports in social and emotional learning are going to help catch kids up when they've missed a week of school. I'm, I'm not sure how that's related at all. But the flip side of all of this, of course, is parents. Mothers are often the ones who are tasked at staying home with sick children. They make up the majority of child care staff and educational work staff. To the minister responsible for the status of women, with so many kids sick, why did you vote against giving mothers and child care workers paid sick days Good. so that they could take care of their children without worrying about missing bill payments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I think all members on this side of the House recognize the importance of paid sick leave, Mr. Speaker. And I know, I know that um, the the work of the Department um, of Economic Growth and Development here is they they are going to be doing a comprehensive review. Uh, and certainly, Mr. Speaker, I know that we're going to get to a place uh, where we do have sick paid sick days on this island. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. It's not a surprise to anyone that we're dealing with a lot of illness on this island right now. I'm hearing from constituents that are sick and they don't know where to go for help. So question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. What medications and treatments are available through the Pharmacy Plus program for respiratory illness? Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. An excellent question. And there was, I believe it's uh, 38 different uh, assessments that uh, under Pharmacy Plus program, Mr. Speaker, that uh, pharmacists can deliver. Uh, certainly that information is online, but if uh, the Honourable Member can't find it, I'll certainly be happy to bring it back and table it. Thank you. Mermaid Stratford. Here, there wasn't 38 um, ways for them to help people with respiratory illness, and that's what I'm getting at. I know pharmacists can prescribe cough suppressants, Tylenol and Adv Advil, but as soon as you get into an infection, they can't help. So the question is, where do they go? Islanders with family doctors are t finding it hard to even book an appointment with their physician with this uptick of illness. Some are waiting two weeks. I spoke to a woman who it has to wait until January. Um, to get her appointment. She has a doctor, so she can't use Maple unless she's got enough money to pay for it. She knows the ER isn't meant for non-emergency issues, such as this, but what other options does she have? So question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. What should islanders like this woman, go, where they, should they go so that they don't end up in the emergency room? Good. Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, and it is. It's a great uh, comment, a great question that's coming forward from the Honourable Member. Uh, first of all, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've all heard uh, of a saying that uh, with regard to prevention, and at the start, Mr. Speaker, I certainly urge all Islanders to make sure that the immunization right across the board is up to grade. Uh, the, to help protect them against whether it's respiratory illnesses or any other type of infection, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, we have put in place a number of different initiatives, such as the access clinics, that can be followed up on uh, subsequent... 
after they access Maple, Mr. Speaker. And I do agree. I see where the member is coming from with regard to uh, patients who are not affiliated, uh, Mr. Speaker. But uh, certainly it is an initiative. It's things that we are working on tirelessly to improve the system, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mermaid Mr. Speaker, that's not, like, Islanders are struggling to get kind of a diagnosis so that they can actually get medications to support them. And the only place for them to go right now is to the emergency room. We know that is not where they should be going, Mr. Speaker. Our emergency room is already overburdened, and our minister should be doing everything possible to keep every single Islander out of there if it is not an emergency situation. So question to the minister, you said that you're looking at every op option, you're working hard at this. So here's a, here's a suggestion, you close the cough and fever clinics. Question to the minister, will you reopen the cough and fever clinics while we're going through this wave of illness here uh, for, so Islanders can get the help that they need? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank the member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I will never rule out anything. I certainly, I certainly will consider anything. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have to look at uh, the Honourable Member referenced in each of her preambles with regard to keeping people out of the emergency department. Mr. Speaker, certainly one of the initiatives, and I referenced it before, but one of the initiatives that we have undertaken to help address that to a certain extent is the Pharmacy Plus program. And there has been, Mr. Speaker, there has been substantial uptake on that program. Thank you. Charlottetown Dover there. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. People living with a disability often have significant expenses in addition to their basic needs that are covered through assured income or social assistance. In addition, Many people who live with a disability are not on either income program, but they still receive other financial supports from the provincial government. For example, if they have specialized transportation needs or mobility equipment or even a service animal, Mr. Speaker. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. I'm hearing from Islanders who live with a disability that they feel forgotten when it comes to policies and announcements from your department. What is your department doing to better support Islanders living with disabilities in these challenging times? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. Uh, so what we just done here uh, approximately a month ago was increased all our social programs through the department as a whole, Mr. Speaker. And right now, obviously, we've seen gaps in po the policies. I'll be first to admit that. Uh, there's complete policy review happening within the department right now. Some are completed and some are still in the works, and I will be able to uh, give an update once they're all completed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. C Speaker. Well, I appreciate the reference to that increase that you put forward earlier this year, it was 8%, and it went on the basic rate for people who get social assistance or assured income benefits. That means um, social programs, social housing clients, there are increases to communication, optical, transportation benefits, all happening in December 1st, in two days, Mr. Speaker. But you know who didn't get that increase? People living with a disability. Question to the Minister, uh, Minister of Social Development and Housing, why will you wait for a review when you can just commit to extending that 8% increase to accessibility clients as well? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and one thing I'll, I don't want to do, Mr. Speaker, is uh, is say something that is not 100% accurate when it comes to those programs, Mr. Speaker. So uh, what I want to do is go back to the department. If there's any gaps in any way, I'll, uh, I'll get back uh, to the department to see what we can do, uh, Honourable Member, because I want to make sure that every Islander, everybody living with a disability, uh, has, uh, has the needs that, uh, that they need to survive right now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Take Nash Palmer Road. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. This session of the legislature, the government table an amendment to the Health Services Payment Act that would see physician resource planning committee that would see that resource planning committee taken away, as well as the complement of regional billing numbers. Ooh. We see the list of government business getting smaller and smaller as the session goes on, but we have yet to see the Health Health Services Payment Act come to the fore for debate. Now, this was supposed to make hiring physicians easier and quicker, something that we certainly need here, but not at the expense of rural islanders. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Will the bill be brought to the floor this session, or did you reconsider and finally realize the harm it could cause to rural PEI? Yes, yes. Health and Wellness. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. No, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, will, the bill will not be brought to the floor this session. Uh, certainly, uh, the Honourable Member is uh, quite correct that the intention of it was to eliminate red tape. But, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we listen to the concerns. We take those concerns under consideration as compared to previous administrations, Mr. Speaker, who just barreled ahead. We take them under consideration, Mr. Speaker. We realize on this side the importance of rural health care, and we're dedicated to it, and we want to make sure that any legislation that comes comes forward will protect rural health care. Thank you. It, it blows my mind that the minister made that statement. But he was the one that is promoting that bill in this floor. So, yeah. It just goes to show how out of touch he is. Um, so I'm all for changes that will help uh, the ability to hire doctors. But not if it means someone from Tignish or even Surrey has to take a day off work to drive an hour or two just to get the health care that they require. Question to the Minister. Dr. Gardham was on Compass a few weeks ago bragging and excited about the new power he's going to have come January. What was wrong with the bill? Who told you to pull it? Or did you finally decide to listen to the concerns of rural animals? Yes, that's what it was. Health and uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have always listened to the concerns of rural islanders, and I will continue to, and that's why we are going to not bring it forward this session, but we are going to make it stronger for rural islanders to protect rural islanders, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Second supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We've seen it with the Residential Tenancy Act. We've seen it with the Supportive Decision Making Act. We've seen it with the Child and Youth uh, Family Services Act and Amendments to our Education Acts, and the list goes on and on. This government has an inability to deserve their commitments in a timely manner due to poor consultation or having no vision, no plan. No plan. Question to the Minister. When you're working on fixing this Act, will you be working on fixing our DNR policies, you know, the ones you seem to have no idea about? Mm. Yes. Well, Mr. Speaker, I could give about a 20-minute answer to that, but I've only got a few seconds here, Mr. Know. Speaker. So the, point, so the point, Mr. Speaker, that I'm going to focus on is his assertion with no plan. No plan. We have a tremendous plan, Mr. Speaker, but the op, uh, third party, when they were in administration, they had one plan, and that plan was an education, Mr. Speaker, and that was, plan was to close rural schools, something that we're not going to do. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party, tame her down. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is absolutely incredible. I don't know what happened to the niceness, but it kind of exactly. went Maybe we can extend the hour and get the other 15 minutes of that answer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we've seen throughout the weekend and even this morning in some parts of the island that winter is slowly creeping upon us. Temperatures are dropping and snow is in the forecast. It's also, stressful, it's also a stressful time for many island families with the holiday season fast approaching as well. Last week, the Premier alluded to a suite of programs that, be, that will be released to help shield islanders from heating costs this winter. Question to the Premier. Will these programs be investments focused on support that will extend throughout the winter months, or will they be in the form of another one-time gift card? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, it seems the government giving people money through gift card has really uh, struck a nerve over in the third party's office, Mr. Speaker. Uh, most islanders I talk to like the gift card, Mr. Speaker. Uh, they'd like to get more of them. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Mr. Speaker, we have tried very hard to help islanders uh, through some of the most difficult uh, uh, challenges that we've faced in over a century, be it COVID, Mr. Speaker, uh, be it the biggest hurricane to ever hit the country, Mr. Speaker, uh, and be it the cost of Living, Mr. Speaker, which is at an all-time uh, high in the last 70 years, Mr. Speaker, across Canada. Uh, so we've delivered a pretty substantive uh, fleet of services uh, to help islanders, Mr. Speaker. Some of them have been with, uh, in the form of one-time payments, although this is the second time, so there'll be two-time payments. And the Minister of Social Development and Housing is actually, uh, will be bringing forward in the days ahead uh, some additional uh, programs, Mr. Speaker, uh, that will be designed to help those people uh, who will uh, heat their homes with, uh, with uh, furnace oil, for example, Mr. Speaker, uh, which again is at an all-time high as well. So we're trying to help the best we can. 
can, Mr. Speaker. I'm the leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, gift cards are great for some if they work and if they get them. Mm -hmm. But not all people are getting them, and they don't always work. <clears throat> Islanders are taking on more household debt as a result of our province leading the country for inflation this past year. So it's safe to say that the January vote buying checks will go out mm. and they'll go towards debt rather than helping Islanders bottom line at the end of the month. Question to the Premier. How much was spent on the gift cards provided to tourists over the years and will your investment to help Islanders with the cost of living this winter be of greater value? Mm. Uh, Premier. Oh, Mr. Speaker, the handful of gift cards we gave out at the airport in the summer of 2020 would be pretty insignificant, I would think, uh, in the big scheme of things. It was more of just a nice gesture welcoming those people who couldn't come back. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we just, uh, you know, tried to do uh, a little bit, uh, put our foot forward to thank all of those uh, who come to PEI, uh, Mr. Speaker, and to welcome them back. Uh, so uh, uh, what we've given out, uh, Mr. Speaker, to Islanders in this latest uh, uh, assistance uh, program, uh, $58 million, Mr. Speaker, that will go directly into the pockets of Islanders, Mr. Speaker. And I would remind the Honourable Leader of the Third Party uh, that one of the biggest reasons we have the highest cost of living, Mr. Speaker, is because most things that come to Prince Edward Island or leave Prince Edward Island come on wheels driven by trucks uh, that require diesel fuel, Mr. Speaker, uh, which the leader of his party in Ottawa is going to charge another 10 cents for, Mr. Speaker. So thank you very much. You couldn't do the deal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Jeez. Speaker, whatever programs this government comes out with will ultimately be Islanders' money, money that this government made from the inflation profits. The merely $150 support government announced for inflation support last March, yeah. which they didn't receive, which people didn't receive until July, didn't even go to the island working poor. Question to the Premier. Mm. Will this initiative support the growing number of our island working poor? Good question. The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think I need some clarity on the working poor and what he would refer to, Mr. Speaker. I think most of the programs were targeted to those at the lower end. The people who made the least income actually got more money, Mr. Speaker. But uh, I guess I stand to be corrected <coughs> from the leader uh, of the third party. As again, Mr. Speaker, I think it's the job of government to try to do the best they can uh, to help Islanders through these difficult times. Mr. Speaker, I don't think there's ever been a government in the history of Prince Edward Island who's contributed more to individuals, Mr. Speaker, or families or community groups, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, largely because of the challenges we've all faced as a province in the last three and a half years, Mr. Speaker. So uh, to steal a line from the honorable, uh, uh, his honorable colleague from Tignish and Palmer Row, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, I guess if the charge is we've tried to give people millions and millions of dollars, Mr. Speaker, to help them through these challenges, I'm guilty as charged. Stratford Tippett. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Preserving and protecting our harbours and waterways is an important issue for all levels of government here on the island. Over the last decade, great effort has been made to reduce or eliminate the number of wastewater discharges into the Charlottetown Harbour. Question the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Change. What role does your department play when an unplanned wastewater discharge happens in an island waterway and where does investigative responsibility lie between the levels of government? Honourable Minister of Environment. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. So when we are notified, we would take immediate action with uh, whatever jurisdiction we're in, whether it's a municipality or if it's a government uh, uh, overseen area. Um, <clears throat> when there's a, a discharge event or when there's, there's something that requires investigation, we would turn it over to justice and we would allow them to investigate and, re and uh, report back and take it from there. Thank you. Dr. Kepik. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so back in August, uh, there was an unplanned discharge of wastewater into the Charlottetown Harbour. Approximately 6,000 cubic metres leaked into the harbour, prompting safety warnings to residents around swimming and water-based activities for several days after 2.5 Olympic pools worth of wastewater spilled into the harbour. Question again to the Minister of <coughs> Environment, Energy and Climate Action. What sort of penalties are in play when an investigation determines fault? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So again, this is something that we would take very, very seriously. And in this case, it was turned over to justice for them to investigate. Uh, they found that it was accidental and it was one of the 
few areas that the experts in my department had ever seen where the lines weren't actually on the, the city map. So the contractor who was working that area was not aware that the, the sewer lines were there because the city of Charlton did not have the marked on the map. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Stratford Quebec. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, as I understand, thing, uh, things, the source of the spill came as a result of work being done by a contractor installing fiber optic lines when a sewer main was struck and then leaked 2.5 Olympic pools worth of wastewater into the harbor over the course of several hours. Again, question the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, you, you say that it was deemed accidental, but at the same time, what measures are put in place and what penalties are in place, whether <coughs> I can't imagine would ever be intentionally done, but there has to be penalties as well for an accident. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Environment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, well, we, we take these obviously very, very seriously. Uh, the Charlottetown Harbour is kind of a, a very contained area where uh, the largest part of the population of Prince of Island lives, so there's a lot of concern about the, the waterways, and I know uh, it has happened a few times over the course of history where wastewater is discharged, so we would charge the individual involved and we would make sure that they uh, face the highest penalty. Of course, that would be up to justice on what that highest penalty would or the ask would be. Um, I guess in this case, the the, the person was found uh, not to be not to be guilty, and it was accidental, and uh, it was because of a mapping error of the city of Charlottetown. But we, in, on a normal circumstance where the contractor was wrong, we would charge them. Thank you. Rustico Emerald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so, like uh, so many in, in the House, I have constituents who are struggling with the high inflationary costs. And, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm not so worried because I know we have a lot of government programs, especially for low-income islanders, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but, um, but one one constituent, you know, the young father, recently separated, two children, wanted to qualify for the provincial dental care program, but couldn't, Mr. Speaker. And then another one in Logan, a couple of seniors, you know, they had their GIS stripped by the federal government. And they, they wanted to qualify for, again, several of the government programs, like the Seniors Independence Initiative, but they can't qualify. And I looked into it. I said, why is this happening, Mr. Speaker? It's because they're using last year's income to qualify them. And this is not a new problem. We've heard questions in the House on this before, and I thought we had this fixed. So I have... I, I know. I, I, I thought I had it fixed, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker... I'm going to try the Minister of Finance on this one. Minister of Finance, why can't an, uh, an applicant's current financial situation be used to determine qualification for government programs? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as the Honourable Member would know, obviously we rely on Canada Revenue Tax data, so obviously there is a lag in that and people filing. So again, it is not the most current um, to date, but it is the most current that we actually can use. Thank you. Rustico Emerald. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know that this can be fixed, and I'd, I'd ask the minister to continue to push forward at uh, the cabinet table. Um, Mr. Speaker, so when we look at uh, these programs across, across different departments, like we've got the Provincial Dental Care Program and Department of Health and Wellness, we've got the various efficiency PEI programs, heat pumps through uh, Environment, Energy and Climate Action, and then, of course, we have many programs of social development and housing. Um, but really, the way we means test is, is not consistent and also it's not very efficient. Every department has their own group that does different means testing. It would be really nice if we had a direct line, for example, to the federal government, uh, an agreement with CRA to do that in an efficient way. So my question, Mr. Speaker, Minister of Finance, would you commit to pursuing a centralized mean testing role within government to make it more efficient and ensure consistency across government programs? Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I think the best approach to that program, uh, to that question, is probably to interact with each department separately. Obviously, each each department and program has different needs and and goals. So I think uh, to do one across the board may may sound simple uh, in in theory, but may not be practical in delivering some of these programs. Rustico Emerald, your second supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think we could actually save money and make it more efficient and more consistent. I, and I think this is something that bears looking at. So, Mr. Speaker. We have a program, for example, a down payment assistance program that has a threshold of $95,000 a household income to qualify. And, uh, you know, a family making more than $95,000 a year doesn't qualify, whereas uh, the threshold for a free heat pump is $55,000. So, I mean, one could make an assumption that this estimate, this is an estimate of what government defines as middle income between, between say, $55,000 and $95,000 household income. 
Um, so these are the island families who are working really hard. These are the economic base of our province. They are the fabric of what happens here on this island. Uh, we're in a high inflation period, Mr. Speaker, with cost of living increasing significantly Question. for all levels of income. Question to the Minister of Finance. What strategies are you considering to help middle income wage earners with increased cost of living? Not about Minister of Finance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the Honourable Member for the question. I think each department looks at some of these issues each and every day um, in order to help Islanders. Obviously, the inflationary support payments is one way, you know, in the short term that we can deal with these issues. And again, back to your reference to the heat pump program, um, it's a stepped program, obviously demand and our ability to deliver on that. So I hope to see some more increments in, as we move up that program, uh, especially with the announcement of the federal government uh, support on that program. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Ty Valley, Sherbrooke. UPEI is currently in collective bargaining with three of its unions. After more than 100 hours of negotiation, the UPEI Faculty Association filed for conciliation on August 5th. Conciliation is intended to be a short, focused process lasting 10 days, but the Faculty Association and UPEI remain in conciliation almost four months later, despite repeated requests to the minister to allow the process to move on. The Faculty Association also reports that the conciliator appointed by the Minister has scheduled very few meeting dates, further hampering, 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 further hampering <laughs> progress. Minister, question, why have you used your ministerial discretion to extend conciliation so far beyond the intended timeline, a move which impedes the co constitutional right of workers to bargain effectively with their employer and which only deepens the current labour instability at UPEI? And culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, this is a very good question. As uh, the two parties are are in the midst of conciliation, Mr. Speaker, there, there is a large list. I think there's 30, uh, 30 mm -hmm. items that they're working their way through, and I heard the process isn't going quite as quick as they want, but it is moving uh, as fast as it can, and uh, that we will, if if uh, if we come to a point where we have to take action, we will, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In September, the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth received an update on the Population Action Plan and labour shortages. Understandably, a growing population means a need to invest in frontline services like health care and education to ensure the readily available to the public, and also a need to build more housing to accommodate this growth. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Under the forthcoming Population Action Plan, how many new housing units will be needed to meet not only our projected population growth, but to achieve government's desired 4% vacancy rate? Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Oh. <laughs> uh, sorry, Mr. Speaker, if she could repeat that question, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. The whole thing? Uh, just, just the last, just the last. Okay. So we learned in the Education and Economic Growth Committee meeting that there were no, we didn't tie our population growth strategy to anything. There are no benchmarks to say, whoa, we need to slow down. Um, a question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Under the forthcoming Population Action Plan, how many new housing units will be needed to meet not only our projected population growth, mm -hmm. but to achieve government's desired 4% vacancy rate? Thank you, and I appreciate the member for repeating that, and I apologize. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that is something we're working on right now. The, the, uh, the strategy will be released really soon, Mr. Speaker. We know the importance of it's a balance between housing and with the workforce, we and we need to attach everything. You're right, absolutely right, and that's what, the, <laughs> that's what the strategy will come with, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Donald, the leader of the official opposition, final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've been monitoring the health of island soils for over two decades now, and that's an extremely long longitudinal study to have on anything. And over that time, there's been a steady decline in organic matter across the province, though with the most recent report, which was released in 2018, it suggested that trend may be bottoming out. I've been looking forward to the next report, which was due last year in 2021, but as far as I know, it has not yet been released. I've certainly heard nothing or seen nothing. To the Minister of Agriculture and Land, do you know what's in this overdue report, and when will we see it? Here, here. Minister of Agriculture and Land. Thank you, Mr. 
Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member, I do agree with you. The soil was declining in nutrients, and I think all uh, farmers realize that uh, they need to give back to the soil and leave it in better shape than they found it. Uh, I'll contact my department at right after question period to find out where we are with that report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of question period. Statements by ministers? Presenting and receiving petitions? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Rule 78.9 of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly regarding responses to petitions tabled under presenting and receiving petitions, I am pleased to respond on behalf of the Government of Prince Edward Island, and I move, second by the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shona Carey. 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 Tabling of documents. The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table response to the sixth report from the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development, and I move, second by the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, Culture, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shona Carey. Do we have another one, Minister? No? The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture. Here's two. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By command of Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg to table the PEI Museum and Heritage Foundation 2021 and 2022 annual report for the period ending March 31st, 2022, and I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that this said document do be now received and do lie on the table. Sure, Carey. Carey, Carey. The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Mr. Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg to table response to the third uh, report of the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth, and I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that this said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shola Carey. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Land, <coughs> Public Safety, and Attorney General. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, by Leader of the House, I beg leave to table respond to the third report from the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability, and I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Sure, Carey. Yeah. The Tignish Palmer Rowe, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And by leave of the House, I beg leave to table an email received from a constituent of District 26, one of the multiple ones I've received over the weekend regarding the DNR policy um, in West Prince. And I move, seconded by the member from O'Leary and Vernas, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Did I miss anyone? Reports by committee. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow, and the Government Whip. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As Chair of the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth, uh, following receipt of a report on committee activities of the said committee on November 25th, 2022, I move seconded by the Honourable Member from Rustico Emerald that the report of the committee be adopted. Uh, your committee is reporting on its activities since the committee last reported on April 6, 2022. Since then, your committee met 16 times to consider its work plan and most recently conducted a series of meetings on the topic of Hurricane Fiona. As a result of the deliberations, your committee is pleased to make a number of following uh, recommendations to the members of the Legislative Assembly. There are a total of 24 recommendations, Mr. Speaker. Uh, our committee met on a number of different topics. Uh, we talked about uh, large-scale assessments. We met on the topic of retaining international students after graduation on the rights of children and youth and of course most recently with the uh Impact. We had emergency meetings on the impacts of Hurricane Fiona. Uh, Mr. Speaker, your committee does thank all those who have shared their knowledge and expertise during this reporting period. I do want to give a special thanks to all those who made themselves available on, on short notice uh, for the series of emergency meetings on the topic of Hurricane Fiona and the impacts here in the province. Your committee recognizes the work of the Standing Committee as well on uh, of, uh, health and social development as well as the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability, who have also conducted their own series of meetings on Hurricane Fiona. Uh, your committee would like to thank the members of all three committees for their work. Um, just uh, on that too, Mr. Speaker, I did want to make uh, a special note because I do want to thank, of course, all the members of the committee, but um, during this uh, committee, Mr. Speaker, uh, our clerk who works extremely hard was Alicia Campbell on October 8th um, and October 9th became Alicia McCacken. 
Akron. So right during the middle of, uh, right after Hurricane Fiona, and then we had the number of meetings that were uh, scheduled thereafter. Uh, she also had uh, the time and the energy and the amazing ability to uh, organize her wedding. So I, I do want to thank her for all her time and congratulate her and Adam uh, McCachran on their marriage. Um, but again, I just wanted to thank all of the uh, all of the community members for all their great work. I want to thank all of the uh, the people who came in to present and. Uh, I think that is it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Is there anyone else that'd like to speak to the report? No? Shut up, Carrie. Uh, introduction of government bills. Government motions, orders of the day, government. The Honorable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Finance that the first order of the day be now read. Shut up, Carrie. Order number one, consideration of the supplementary estimates in committee. The Honourable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Finance that this House to now resolve itself into committee of the whole House to take into consideration grant of uh, supplementary supply to His Majesty. Shall it carry? The Honourable Member from Tignish Pomeroy, Deputy Speaker to Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supplementary supply to His Majesty. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? granted. Would you please state your name and position for answer? Uh, Gordon McFadden, Executive Director, of Fiscal Management. Good afternoon and welcome, Gordon. Um, honorable members, we are on page seven, Schedule A, Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, to fund capital expenditures related to cost overruns, timing of project work, and project scope additions at Basin Head Provincial Park and the Mark Andres Provincial Ski Park. Total expenditure, $4,597,000. Charlottetown Belvedere. Welcome back. A um, couple of quick questions on this section. Um, it's, saying it's, it's, in, it's for Basinhead and Mark Ahrens. Could you just give us a breakout of how much is for each of those projects? Um, within this um, request for special warrant, uh, approximately 524000 for um, Basinhead and the balance around $4 million for uh, Mark Ahrens. Charlottetown Belvedere. Okay, so we're looking at over four million, around four million for for um, the marker rents part, which is it, it, are those, um, is that work entirely associated with the preparation for the Canada Winter Games? Uh, yes, okay. Charlottetown Belvedere. So in that case, the, you know, you've you've ref, you've obviously shown a significant revenue offset, which is 
almost equivalent to the expenditure? Is that um, coming from funding associated with the revenue with the Winter Games, or is it from another source? Uh, yes, there's a portion of revenue that um, is coming from the Canada Games group themselves. So they do some fundraising and uh, and have some funds from the federal government as long as funds from us. Charlton Belvedere. Okay, so in this particular expenditure, there's very little, if any, provincial money actually going onto that, that Canada Games expenditure. Is what I'm hearing. It's almost it's almost a match. Uh, very very close. Very close. Sure. Okay. Charlton Belvedere. Good, and and just to go back then to the Basin Head expenditure, that that was um, um, is that associated with the additional cost relating to the kind of the dredging and so on that had to be done? Um, not entirely dredging. There was an engineering solution to try to prevent future sediment right. um, um, buildup. So there was a system put in a little bit farther out the, uh, the harbour to try to um, impede the infiltration of, of sediment. Okay. Charlottetown Belvedere. Um, and, and this may not be the right place, but is, is there provincial expenditure on the Canada Games showing up elsewhere that like this is the one that I could see that was you know a direct expenditure with an offset revenue is there some other other expenditures in this uh, n not not in this particular document um, okay. for this particular year and or for this document for next year yes right. <laughs> Charlottetown Belvedere it's the gift that keeps on giving okay um, I'm, I'm good there for now thank yep. you chair you're welcome mermaid Stratford great thanks chair just a quick question on the Mark Arends Park. Um, with that construction, there was damage done to water, a waterway. Do you have, is any of the money allocated in this special warrant um, to repair those damages? Do you have a, like, do you know how much that would have cost the province to, to repair? Uh, I, I don't have the specifics on that particular repair. The, the, the funding for this project for this fiscal year would have been based on the planned work that was um, required for uh, getting the site ready for Canada Games. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And can you just talk about timing on this? Because it came through as a special warrant, but we had approved funding for Canada Games. Um, so I'm just, I'm interesting on, interested in why the special warrant was required when we knew that this expenditure was coming up. So. Um, as we've talked about several times in here, this was a multi-year capital project, so mm -hmm. it was happening over um, two, if not parts of three years. Um, you know, the process of getting the work planned um, and organized and, and delivered um, kind of affected uh, the timing for sure of, of some of the cash flow, um, and as well the scope of the, the project uh, was, was enhanced a little bit to uh, further kind of show it as, as more of a legacy project, so we're going to have a better Nordic site and, and, and a better downhill site uh, uh, as a result. I think the snow making equipment was upgraded and, and the, 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 I'll say the clubhouse where there's an elevator installed, there was parking improvements, so um, I think at, at the end of the day, um, <coughs> once they kind of get into it, they, they saw that this is what was needed for, uh, for a showcase event. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And those items that you just mentioned, Gordon, I would agree, like, you know, looking forward, um, would have probably been on a capital list of some sort at some, like, at some point in time in that five-year period. So was it not identified at the time of planning when we came forward with the original operational budget of what this would cost or capital budget of what this would cost? Did we not have that allocated already? Um, for sure, there, there were parts of it that, that were allocated. The, the one that I, I can recall um, specifically was the enhanced snowmaking capabilities. They, they have mm -hmm. a certain level and wanted to make sure that their older equipment would be running up to snuff, so they enhanced the equipment uh, quite a bit. Um, and, and as well, the kind of the roadways were identified, I think, after the fact on the accessibility. I don't know if you've been down the road. It's a fairly narrow road it with is. ditches, so I think they've made some improvements uh, for traffic flow out there uh, that wasn't necessarily in the first. And, and I think the biggest issue um, was sort of some cost uh, pressures related to the industry. Um, some of the uh, earthworks and some of the uh, projects to uh, for the building and the sort of movement and constructing of, of the new ski slope course 
uh, I think, were a little more than, than they, they were planning for. Mayor Mate Stratford. I think I'm good, Chair. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Carry, carry. Education on lifelong learning to fund expenditures related to the school health food program, UPI for planning and startup costs for the new medical school, the expansion of the faculty of nursing, and the expansion of the health and wellness clinic, and for year end salary accruals. Total ten million seven hundred thousand. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. I'll uh, provide the amount from this overall warrant that was for the school food program and what those expenditures were for. Um, yes, it was approximately a million dollars for the school food program. Charlottetown Belvedere. And, and what was that oh, to provide? Oh, what was for? Um, being the first year of operation, there would have been some projections on what the actual <clears throat> cost of the meals and, and some of the uh, supports to uh, provide the meals uh, was going to be, and as well the kind of repayment, uh, sort of the pay what you can model, um, kind of lends itself to a little bit uh, of an unknown territory for us. Um, yeah. So we're a little bit uh, higher expectations, I guess, on the actual uh, suggested pay amount, and uh, that didn't quite come come through. Charlotte Belvedere. Yeah, and that makes sense given our current climate as well. And I guess it's the longer you go, the more you, the better we're going to get probably at estimating it. But um, I, I appreciate, I still think it's a really small investment for the benefit. So. Just get that out there. Um, regarding the um, the post secondary expenditures, you've got medical school, faculty of nursing, and clinic. Um, we haven't started construction on the new medical school, so is, this is just for planning. Uh, some planning and some startup costs. They had to, I guess, get a team together to work on the so project management team. Okay. Um, and there was a little bit, um, I think, on the expansion of the nursing that was kind of could go a little faster than the, school, the Faculty of Medicine. Charlottetown Belvedere. And then the remainder of that is it was looking at um, the Faculty of Nursing and, and the Health Clinic. Can you just speak to what those investments were for? Yeah, there, there's a small sort of health clinic out there now, and, and with the Faculty of Medicine coming on, they, they part of the, uh, the, the request was to, uh, to build some additional space for a larger clinic. Um, so the, in the new Faculty of Medicine building, there'll be some space for uh, for an actual clinic on site at UPEI. Charlottetown Belvedere. So just, just to be clear, so does that expenditure, um, was that entirely then for planning, or is there any actual construction that's happened within that four million plus expenditure so far? Yeah, again, because this was uh, a special warrant kind of issued in the summer when the project was authorized, um, this would have been the request at the time and the thought that where they would be. Um, so in that, they would have had some money for some initial architecture as well. I think it was about 800000 within that. Uh, and I'm not sure where they're at with that part of the part of the uh, expenditure. Charlottetown Belvedere. Okay. I just, I just like, obviously I'm a huge fan of project management, but it just seems an awful lot of money. Yeah. Um, to be fair, now this is a grant to them. Right. So they're running the project, so you know they have money from us to do the work. They have to account back for what okay. the work was done. Um, so, so we can imply from that that, that not maybe that because it's a grant, that money isn't necessarily all expended as yet. It's not in the same under the same kind of requirement yeah. as it would be for other projects. I, I'd have to go back to the reporting requirements of the particular arrangement with with education, and uh, there is a, a committee there that is is working with UPEI. So. I suspect part of it would be reporting back on actuals kind of okay. incurred and, and where they're at with timing and cash flow. Charlottetown Belvedere. I, I would look forward to seeing that just because it just really stood out as the, the it's, it's a large, it's a large amount when we look at it being primarily for planning. And like I said, I understand the costs, especially if you need to retain sort of longer term contract staff. It just seems um, a lot. So it would be really good to get kind of an update on, on what's happening with that if that's yeah. possible. Chair, if I can ask another one. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, the other piece was around the uh, year-end salary accruals, which I th I'm guessing is that 5.4 million under financed admin for the public schools. Is that is that what I'm seeing there? Yes. Um, yes. I know we've heard a lot about sort of extra hires and so on, but that's a lot to be off on the salary budget. Is there any kind of background on on how we ended up so far off on the budget? Um. Well, the school boards are almost all salaries, like the, yeah. the grants to school boards, so they are in excess of $200 million for, for salary. 
uh, for grants for salaries. Um, um, at the end of the year, there is a couple of outstanding contracts, so they would be trying to foreshadow what those settlements might be without getting into the specifics of what the bargaining positions are for government. Uh -huh. um, but there would be amounts that would have been set up that would have been, at the end of the year, uh, audited by the Auditor General to have the assumptions under which support the expense. Now, again, this would be the planning side yeah. of where they thought they were going to be at for the year. Charlottetown Belvedere. I actually remember having a discussion with you on about this before. This feels very familiar. So, so thank you for the remind the the, the uh, diplomatic reminder of, of that conversation. Yeah, um, and, and you're right. Like in, a, in, a, in an overall salary budget of 200 million, this is a, a percentage of flex, which makes sense given the the, the, the amount of um, transactional activity that would happen in a salary budget of that scale. So so thank you for that clarification. Um, that's the only other question I had in here was just there was a, a thing in here around the professional services as an external line item. It was 325,000 um, for external relations and education and then 725 for grants. If you could just provide yeah. advice on what those indicate. Yeah, th those two amounts relate to the school food program. Oh, those, that's the full, pro right. Yeah, so gotcha. part of it would be the operations of the school food program and some would be grants right. to the... Yeah, I'd had that in my totals as a million rather than not, not seeing it as the breakdown. I'm good, thank you, okay. Chair. Mermaid Stratford. Great, thanks, Chair. Well, I have a few questions. Um, so around the uh, grant to UPEI for the planning and startup costs for the new medical school. So you had mentioned requ um, reporting requirements. Um, so I would have to assume there is a document and a, uh, there's an agreement between UPEI and the province as to what they will deliver for that $4 million that was, per that was granted to them. Can you, is that a document you can table? Uh, that's, that's an agreement between the department and UPEI. I, I can ask to see whether and I don't have it, so um, I can see if I can get a copy of it and see if they'll be interested. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. I would be really interested in that. Um, so this is the first $4 million of approximately $122 million that has been allotted for this project. Um, has, the, has there been um, a reporting document or a business requirements document provided to the province to support that $122 million commitment from UPEI? Has that been provided to the to government? Um, the information that I've seen um, would, would support sort of the capital, the capital cost of the construction of the facility along with uh, some expected operating costs over a period of, a period of time. Um, and that sort of between the capital costs and their kind of interest costs on, on, the, on the project would form the basis of a grant to UPEI over a period of time uh, into the future. Mermaid Stratford? In the future oh, and into oh, the future. Okay. Mermaid Stratford? Great, thank you. Um, who in government is, re is actually providing the oversight of this project to ensure that all of the reporting is done as per the requirements? I'd, I'd have to check for you. There, there is a committee that, that struck. I, I'm not on it, so I'll have to get some details for you. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the reason why I ask, Gordon, is because, you know, I've, I've asked several ministers um, around about this. I would really like to know which department, which minister would be the one that is providing the oversight and accountability on this project. I haven't been able to identify sure. that yet because nobody's really been able to say that they've seen a business case, for instance, or a plan on this. So I would love to know who that person is so that um, maybe they might have more information. I'll see what I can find. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. So perhaps the finance minister knows which department might actually be responsible for the um, to, for the oversight on that $4.2 million grant that has been committed to be spent? Just a department. I'd love to know which department. Is it actually under education and lifelong learning, or is there somebody else? 
So I, I would reference Gordon's last answer again back to the committee that, that's done. And, and again, back in the 4.2, it relates to the pace of the project and why it was accelerated. So that's why that number is advanced at this point, is that you know they, they we increased the pace of the project. So. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. I wasn't sure that's what Gordon had said when he had uh, <coughs> when he had spoken to the 4.2 million. It was for the project team and for the planning of the project. So is there an acceleration that's happened with the, because my understanding is it's a year behind in what it was actually supposed to be opened. So I'm not yeah. sure yeah, why, no, I, how it's accelerated. Yeah, no, I, I think when you said it pays, not necessarily accelerated, uh, but um, yeah, I think when this initial 4.2 million was, was provided to UPEI for the planning, there was definitely a very quick pace planned for this particular project. Um, since that initial sort of agreement was signed, there was some leadership changes at, at UPEI, in, in which case the pace of the project is not quite as fast as they were kind of planning. Um, so um, that's why I said they definitely have our planning money, continue to plan with that particular amount of money. Um, they're pr proceeding, as, as I understand it, into uh, uh, the space planning and, and into the architectural phase of it. They've identified a site at, on, on campus for, for the building to go, and, and, and they are proceeding. Mayor yeah. Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Um, in my experience, there would be, on a project like this, uh, project management prime or somebody who would be, like, at the top of that project management team do you know who that person is? I, I do not. Um, there was definitely within the planning money uh, funds provided to uh, develop a project management office and uh, and um, and have a team in place to to push the project along. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. So, question then: If I wanted to find out who would be the lead of that project. What minister would I ask? Well, this special warrant is with the Department of Education. They have the, uh, one of the key relationships with you, the university. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And I did attempt to ask the Minister of Education and like, Lifelong Learning questions on it, and the Minister of Health and Wellness was the one that answered those questions. I just don't understand right now like, why there is so little information as to who's actually the lead and at the executive council table who is you know the one that's responsible for this so i'm struggling with that like is it the premier is it the minister of education lifelong learning is it minister of finance is the minister of health i haven't been able to get that information chair so i'm wondering if Perhaps the Minister of Finance, when he is at that Executive Council table, can let me know who's actually providing reports back to Executive Council on the reporting requirements for UPI. Okay. Do you have any more on this, or do you want me to? I can go, come back to you. I have others on the list. Yeah, please put me at the bottom okay. of the list. Okay. Valeria and Vernes. Um, so an expansion of the Faculty of Nursing. Uh, how much money is assigned to that, to that $10.7 million, and how many new seats uh, or new nurses will that graduate? I'm assuming you start out with new admittances, but... Yeah. Or is there any new admittances? Yeah, yeah there, there, was, there was an expansion yeah. of seats. from 64 to 70 seats, six more seats. Six. So, so six more seats. Six more six seats. More seats. Correct. Okay, Correct. that's not going to go a long ways in trying to change the uh, trajectory of uh, nursing vacancies in Prince Edward Island. Uh, how much money is assigned to that? Um, within the planning and that the money that you're what's on the table here today talking, um, Relatively small component, um, 85,000 85, for the costs of the four million that for the planning. Okay. So, like, mostly it's it, 
kind of built, but there's a little bit of reorganization out at UPEI for the extra space that's going to be required. Now it's only six students, but I think the lab space and they had to be enhanced a little bit. All area and So that amounts just for some additional <coughs> expansion to the labs itself. I mean, I, I get I get the point that you're you know. The six more students yeah. in a classroom of, of uh, 60 isn't going to change a, mm. a whole lot in that regard, but the lab space would be stuff. So the student-teacher ratio, none of that would be changing, I'm assuming. Uh, there would be a little bit of op additional operating money um, over, the sec over the period of time as well. Again, so within the relationship with UPEI, um, when the faculty of nursing was first envisioned, those were new salaries that went in, so the grant increased. Uh, mm -hmm. We provide, you know, tuition comes off that, so it's a fairly iterative process with the university as to what our contribution to uh, the actual faculty of nursing is, but there will be an ad additional, uh, but it has not, not, nothing in this four million. It'll be in the next operating budget and future mm -hmm. operating budgets for. Oh, Larry and Vernesse. So, so maybe I might have misunderstood. Did you say 85000 is a tribute to this six more nursing seats, or did I mishear that? Just for the planning money. Just for the planning this, part, 85000 This, $85, this okay. particular... Yeah, okay, I, I'm with you now. Okay. Okay, question, Chair, again. Oh, Larry and Vernesse. So when it comes to the... I mean, there's $10.7 million in total in this, and we are talking the medical school. Something that I run into yesterday a bit, we had some meetings. Uh, is there going to be many renovations required to all our, our hospitals and healthcare facilities to uh, handle the, the, these students that are going to be going out to their preceptors to be able to work in our facilities? So, what, so I, I, I get the medical school part. So is that part of the planning of that money to also look at planning and renovating all our other facilities? Um, I, when we were debating the capital budget, there was an allotment in there as well to, I don't say expansions, but enhancements, I guess, would be a better term, to our existing clinics and hospital space to accommodate the, the new students. But now it's not next year, and you know, it's a couple of years out, yes. Right. Okay. Well, Larry and Vernesse. Yeah, I think that's all I have for now, Chair. Thanks. Okay. Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in here, can you tell me... Um, how much is going towards the expansion of the health and wellness clinic? Can you tell me how much is going towards the wellness clinic? In this particular planning money, um, approximately 600000 Charlottetown West Royalty. Okay, and can you tell me a little bit more about that wellness clinic? It's the existing wellness clinic, and it's... Definitely within the new Faculty of Medicine building, there will be an enhanced clinic space um, built for, for I think, you know, the, the patient population at UPEI and, and whoever else they'll see out there, I guess. Charlottetown West Royalty. So when is that clinic going to be open? Uh, I guess the building has to get built first, uh. so... <laughs> Charlottetown West Royalty? But, but what I don't understand is that if the UPEI, the startup cost for the new medical school, that's attached to the new medical school, but it's a separate line. Yeah, they had provided a little bit of a breakdown of their request for planning money. So within the $4 million that was uh, requested and, and included in this special warrant amount, there was three components to it. Um, the expansion of the Faculty of Nursing, uh, a new faculty of medicine and uh, significantly enhanced clinic space. Charlotte, how much royalty? But I mean, I understand about the the faculty of nursing, but why were those not joint as one request? I mean, it just seems like uh, a health and wellness clinic would just be on the bottom floor potentially of a of a bigger building, but here there's two financial request or breakdown. I'm not sure why that... No, I, within, this is one project within one contract with UPEI to deliver these three kind of enhancements to their faculties of nursing, medicine, or in, in introduction, I guess, of the faculty of medicine and the, the requisite uh, upgrades and enhancements to uh, a clinic. Mm -hmm. Charles, how much royalty? Now, is that going to be an, an outpatient type are we looking at outpatient, inpatient, or what, what, what are we? Oh, I don't think it's any inpatient spots. I, 
I haven't seen the, the floor plan and the master plan and program for it, but when they talk about a clinic, I envision kind of walk in, walk in, walk out services. Charles, what's your to How does that fit within the medical home model that is currently being underway with government? Good question for the Department of Health. I, I, I assume it would be part of it, and mm -hmm. it, all the new models that they're planning would have that same model. Charles, how much royalty? Do you think the Department of Health is, we, we obviously couldn't, we could barely find out what department we're supposed to talk to here. Is the Department of Health involved in this portion of it? Well, Department of Health are, are our experts on, on building clinics and um, they're not the experts of running medical schools because that's not what they do, but um, definitely I, I would suspect that they'll have some significant input on the clinic space. Um, they don't do any teaching, so it's not that's not their kind of role. Charles, how much royalty? Um, we had mentioned, I mean, the last thing I heard is that, you know, it, there was a there was an accelerated time for, for the medical school. Then it, there was a year-long delay. Um, there we see more money come in. Is that year-long de delay still there, or has this set us back even more? What, what, where, when, when is, when are we looking at this place opening? Um, I, I don't have that information here. That you know, this funding yeah. is for the kicking the project off and the planning side of it. Charles Thomas Royalty. And I guess um, I thought that money was already was allocated, and I mean, we talked about that. There was four million dollars in the in the uh, spring budget. Um, Minister, do you know, or when, when you're giving up this much money um, as a new finance minister, do you ask when are we when are we looking at a goal to get the medical school up and operational? Well, the short answer to that is we're really only talking about the five, the four point two million on the supplementary estimates right now. It's, it's not a cap. You know, we're not debating the capital budget or the delivery of the of the of, this, of the facility. So. <laughs> I prefer to stay on track with, with again, the, the, the planning money and so on and so forth with regards to the debate. Charles Thomas Royalty? But constituents want to know that mm -hmm. if, if there's a four, there's a whole lot of money being spent on this, that it's not just blindly put out and we can punt this down the road for years. They are the ones paying for this medical school. So I'm asking you as the responsible person of this, <laughs> when, when are you pushing for this to be open, Minister of Finance? Mm -hmm. I guess the, again, the short answer to that is I'm confident that you know we've met the milestones as so far. And again, there's been some challenges. Again, back to you know the loss of the proponent at the university definitely set the project back. But I, I would think that we're back on track. Charles, how much royalty? What is back on track? When can we expect this to be open from a provincial government standpoint? And you, as being the representative, what year are we looking at this place opening? Because we've been down this road for three years with the with uh, with other facilities. Okay. Yep. Oh no! Just what information I have based on the last time they were um, an up, provide an update to to finance for sure on, on the project was that they were proposing to start the first class uh, in the fall of 24. Charles, how much royalty? So the fall of 24 is that is that target is that going to happen for the fall of 24? Can you guarantee that this building will be opened by the fall of 24? I am not a project manager. <laughs> Charlottetown, West Royalty? I don't have that, that expertise. <laughs> Here lies the problem. We don't even have a business case for this, as pointed out by uh, colleagues. So I'm, just, I'm just worried because you get, you get down this, this is big, we want to do it right, um, and there's, there's, there's a lot of questions to this point. So what, um, what are you going to do as the Minister of Finance to make sure that, you know, with this information that it, becomes clear that we both, we need some 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 participation or some keys between different departments and the university. Minister, uh, what are you going to do to make sure that everything runs on smooth for an opening of fall of 2024? Well, I think with any project in government, again, you know, we don't have a pulse on the day-to-day -day operations of every single bill that we do in, in government, so we do get regular updates, again, uh, through the the regular mechanisms. So again, you know, 
we do trust that, that those departments can deliver on, on this and any other kind of capital project that we have. Charles, how much royalty? Um, just, um, just a little bit about, uh, just a couple questions on the, the school, school food program. I missed how much uh, was, was the allocation from this 10 million uh, went into the over, over just for the school proof food program? 1.05. One, a little over a million dollars. Okay. Charlton, what's royalty? And um, now, with that, with that, um, I mean, COVID, COVID was difficult. I mean, they did a great job of, of the department did a great job of making sure that kids got food um, at home if they needed it. Families got food at home. Um, do you know if that? added to the cost or took away from the cost in the end of that uh, for last year? Is this, are, are we going to, like, if we do that again, obviously, are we going to, are we going to make sure that those, 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 that, that food gets to people at home? And, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to think about, back about how disruptive COVID was and that, that we did well with that. Did that cost extra for the program or take away from? Um. Definitely, there there would be a little bit of t transportation costs when you go from sort of delivering to a single point to to many points. Um, so there, undeniably, during COVID, uh, there were some additional transportation costs. Uh -huh. um, um, but the lion's share, I think, of what we saw was kind of the growing of the pro program, um, trying to understand what the trends on the, the pay what you can model would, would yield. Um, were estimates and they would be kind of a net cost to government so if the pay what you can was down the cost to government is up mm -hmm. um, so there was some of that for sure um, and and getting you know um, menus and, and getting meals out I think the goal was to try to get get menus that people would subscribe to um, meeting the, you know, the healthy eating options and, and, and still uh, be able to do it you know say cost effectively but cost effectively um, as everyone does with their own home food budget but um, again the, the goal is to get meals out there uh -huh. and, and I think they, they achieved that and at the end of the day on the first year of business it ended up being more than they had funds for. Charles how much royalty? And just um, the, the food program I know this government um, announced uh, uh, an eastern Prince Edward Island pilot program uh, last year for I think it was two hundred fifty thousand dollars did that program start and is it is it was it paid for by by this no no Charles, senior sorry. the Department of um, seniors and housing we're, we're doing that initiative okay so Charles, Charles, did, did it did it get off the ground uh, I'm, I'm not aware yeah there town West royalty okay um, no that's it for me for now thanks Chair. Mayor Stratford thanks Chair. Um, so, for the $4.2 million that's been spent, <laughs> has the government received, so you've received the reporting requirements. So the first step of any project is to identify what the scope of the project is. The original scope of the project was that we're going to build a medical school and it's going to have a 10,000 person um, clinic in it. So. We wrapped that $50 million around that scope, and now we understand that the scope has grown because now it's going to include uh, UPEI Faculty of Nursing and the PsyD program, and, um, and then that was part of the reason why the bigger building was required, and now this, so that's an that's increase of scope, therefore an increase of budget of the overall project. So this $4 million, did that, um, is it spent, and if so, under that reporting requirements, did that come with a full business requirements document, like that whole um, scope um, document, in order to um, identify um, that what that planning process looks like going forward? That was a whole lot said in one sentence. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, as I indicated earlier, the four million was provided to UPEI in 21-22 fiscal year yeah. for. Um, to start up the planning process. Um, as I understand it, as the planning process unfolded, uh, they had been in contact with, um, I think, the Memorial University, who is the, we're getting kind of the curriculum from. They're 
kind of trying to replicate what's going on at, at Memorial. Um, they had some meetings and some initial f through the master pro programming master plan um, saw that the initial size of the building was not going to be quite sufficient to to meet the needs um, over the long term. Um, so they definitely came back to government with a, a revised uh, financial ask. Um, the reason they come back to government is, is twofold. Is uh, under their act, they have need government's authority to borrow. Mm -hmm. um, so, and whether or not government would be on side with uh, the plan as it was proposed, uh, government was on side, provided the additional authority to borrow and uh, amended the project. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for that. So typically when you go through that project life cycle, there's different um, milestones within the governance process, right? So at one point you'd be like, so it's going to be $122 million plus or minus 100%, 50%, 25%, what, whatever. As you get further into your planning of the project, that variance, that surety of what the plus or minus um, will be gets much smaller, right, Cause until you get to launch where you think that you have everything all squared up. So that $122 million, like that, this $4 million would be identifying what that price tag would be and what all of the requirements are to be accomplished in order to complete the medical school. Um, are, do you know at what stage we would be at? So that $122 million, are we at like a plus or minus 50% um, governance um, gating stage or where would we be there? How sure are we that the 122, 122 million is going to be the number based on the planning that they've done to date? I'm pretty sure that 122 won't be the number because um, within that there's a financing component based on future interest rates that we're going to have to come back to. So um, whenever I, I I, I indicated I'd go try to see if I can find who are on the oversight committee mm -hmm. um, to uh, provide that exact kind of oversight that you're talking about, yeah. um, where, where the minister and I sit at finance when there are uh, times when the project is not meeting its targets. That's mm -hmm. when they'll be back to us, and yeah. if they're not back to us, we assume that they are meeting their targets. Yeah. We're right, Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And Gordon, I appreciate that <coughs> completely. That you know, there's others within hope, like others within government that are more connected to this project. And I've often said, I wish they were the ones sitting at the table so that I didn't have to direct everything at you. Um, and I completely appreciate that you always rise up to the challenge. Um, I just wish that, you know, we had the people that could really speak in detail to it at the table because at the end of the day this is four million dollars of a hundred and twenty two million dollar project which islanders are asking about lots of people are appreciative like really want to see the medical school come to fruition then there's also people who are like holy smokes 122 million dollars is that it or is it going to be 200 million dollars by the end of it is it going to be 250 by the end of it like what is that number actually look like and unfortunately this legislative assembly hasn't been provided any documentation to give us any sure certainties or even estimates as to where we might be in the current process and I do know that in the current process, if you're actually, if you've got good governance in place, we go through a very specific gating process to um, provide that information so that we can capture um, overruns or underspends or challenges or risks well before we get ourselves way down the path. And that's the kind of information that I'm looking for because I think if we're making decisions on $122 million projects, that's the least that this legislative assembly can be provided so that we know that we're going in the right, or at least where we're going and, and what we might be looking at, looking at in the future. So that might be maybe a topic that we put forward to the Health and Social Development Standing Committee so that we can dig into that a little bit further so the right people, and not that you're not the right people, but the people with the details are actually sitting at the table so we can talk to them about it. So at this point in time on this $4 million, I don't have any further questions. I just would like to point, um, say that, you know, that reporting requirements document that um, was referenced from between UPEI and the department. 
I really, really would like to see that tabled. So I would just like to flag that chair that um, I would like to see that document provided to to the legislature. So at least we have something in hand to understand what the magnitude of this project is. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Carry. Fisheries and communities to fund expenditures related to the real property tax credit program due to higher property value assessments and higher construction than expected. $675,000 total. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, you don't have a revenue offset on this, so you're talking about um, increased building, increased construction, but um, there's no additional revenue on this. Is that what's the reason for not being able to offset it? Yeah, um, the genesis of this program is when when the HSD came in. We used to have a provincial tax credit for municipalities I had to refund the provincial <coughs> share of the property of the sales tax. So this is kind of trying to make a level playing field with the transition. So as municipalities are incurring capital costs, they can apply back to get that portion of the tax refunded to them. So it was a good building year for municipalities, so mm -hmm. it was a higher budget year for the department. Right. Charlottetown Belvedere. I am surprised that you didn't plan for higher construction numbers, considering we've been forecasting them pretty, pretty aggressively. Yeah. It seems like yeah. a bit odd that you underestimated, but... To be, to be fair, um, what they're planning to do and what they actually get done sometimes are two different things. Yeah, good point. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we just, we've just been talking about that, planning versus actual. So, um, so the province currently collects and keeps the majority of property taxes. Um, so, you know, you're explaining this is kind of like a, a program that makes a bridge for the municipality. Um, how much do you actually then pass on to the municipality? Like, like you know, we're obviously we're hearing from the, you know, um, the uh, the Federation of Municipalities that that they would like to see the province get out of property taxes so that municipalities can increase their tax capacity or at least have more flexibility in their tax capacity rather than this kind of a patchwork program. How is how you know has that? How long do you think that this, we're going to have to keep doing this? Is there something that of a change coming potentially coming in terms of how we do property taxes? Might be for the minister. You can answer that better than I can. Um, yeah, we, we have a very mixed service delivery here in PEI, so, yeah. um, you know, you could look to many different jurisdictions that have a different tax kind of regime on the property side. Um, you know, the, the, the history on, on PEI where municipalities were directly involved goes back to the days when they used to run education and social programs, so mm -hmm. they had all the, the, the capacity because they were delivering the services. So we're in it because we're delivering services as well. Um, it is a form and, and, and an ability to uh, to raise taxes. We are kind of the, let's say, the land owner, but the land uh, service provider in a lot of the unincorporated area as well. So I think we have to be in the space for mm -hmm. um, for for property taxation. Um, we run the tax system on behalf of all the municipalities. So we send out the tax bills. We collect on their behalf. We remit the taxes based on the assessments. We're responsible for all the collection, and so if, if no taxes, taxes aren't collected, that, that's on us, not on them. They get full full reign for it, and and they have their own mechanism to have a portion of it. Um, it's crowded for sure with with the provincial and uh, municipal and waste watch and some for fire dues and things like that, but. Um, I think that the contribution is, is, again, just the general revenues, and we'd have to make that up somewhere else to find the $130 million that we're collecting in, in, in property taxes. Cheryl mm -hmm. here. Thank you, Gordon. I, I appreciate that. Obviously, you know, <clears throat> you know, we've got a push for municipalities to deliver more by, you know, through the, the particularly with amalgamations and with, and with you know, so there, there's, there's always that balancing act and, and, I, and I absolutely get, you know, you've got the difference between sort of municipalities that are able to provide services um, and then on the far side of that you've got municipalities that are really struggling and then you've got the unincorporated, but, at, you know, if we're making changes to how municipalities are meant to sort of make decisions and, and deliver them, we need to sort of think about how we provide them funding to do that too. So, you know, I get that this particular um, piece is, was, is specifically around that, that tax credit program, which is sort of a historic piece, but, you know, it also shows that you need to make changes, uh, you know, to, to address and reflect 
the current circumstances. And I'm, and I'm certainly hearing, particularly from rural municipalities and some of the smaller ones, that they're really restricted in what they can do. Um, and, and that tax capacity is, is one of the spaces. I'm not advocating for higher taxes. I'm just saying that that flexibility is one of the pieces in there. So I guess it's more of a general piece that, um, you know, where that, that when you talk about things that you review, is this up for review or discussion at any point in conjunction with those municipalities? Is that is that something that's on the radar? De definitely, this department has a relationship with um, the Federation of PEI Municipalities, yeah. and there's agreements in place with them that they are, I think, currently negotiating. So that's where reform would come. Okay. Um, again, as you mentioned, there's just a myriad of services trying to be funded by something. Yeah. And this is one of those somethings. Yeah. Charlotte Town Belvedere. And I think it's really encouraging to hear that it is the Federation that is providing that voice because that's that's their role and, yeah. and they are very clear and I, and I understand that there's a gap between you know perhaps what they're looking for and what the province is willing to to do okay. you know because if they said that complexity is there but that dialogue is really important to reflect the changing picture of what we need to provide. Um, yeah, I think I think I'm good for their chair. And that, uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Shall the section carry? Carry. Social development and housing to fund expenditures related to salaries and grants supporting children in the care of providence and increased operational costs supporting clients at the PEI Housing Corporation. Total one million five hundred seventy-eight thousand three hundred. Charlotte and Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on the grants for supports. I'm sorry, which, which grant are you talking about? The, the grant supporting children in the care of the province. I'm wondering if you can explain those. Um, as I understand it, it was more of a capacity issue. Um, there were more children in care than um, for this, than the budget that was available for this particular section. Charlotte Hammer, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. So a, a capacity issue. So what, what was done to alleviate some capacity issues? Well, I'm, I'm definitely not the expert on, on what funding goes out to support children in care, but um, there was more of them um, during the year than, and again, the, you know, the process for kind of determining a special warrant for the department, um, they kind of went backwards at the end of the year, 21-22, uh, and see where all the variances are to try to kind of understand where they may have been uh, um, a little bit short um, to try to provide some, some information for the house here as to uh, as to how and why additional funding is required. Charlotte Town Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I, I missed what you said at the end there. Did you say you would bring something <coughs> back, or did you? No, nope. no. I just said that they go through a, a process to try to identify variances because at the end of the day they get voted a total sum of money to run the government pro their their programs. And when that money is not sufficient, they're in a deficit, a special warrant is required, they'd look backwards through the, the many spots and, and services they're running to try to identify some of the uh, items ca causing some of the variants. And, and this children in care was one of them. Charlotte sure. Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm wondering how much of these salaries went to new jobs versus wage increases? Uh, mostly, uh, I know there was a big uh, push on during the year to take some kind of casual and temporary positions and turn them into full-time positions. Um, so that would be driving some of, of the cost uh, variance for, for salaries. Charlotte Town Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, so do you know if there's any longer-term plan to improve wages for, for, work, for island workers who work with children in care of the province? Uh, those would be governed by a, a contract or a relationship uh, agreement with uh, with the various entities um, and, and individuals. Um, I think they're always kind of discussing uh, what's the appropriate amount of re remuneration. Um, I know that um, you know from the government side, we're trying to get as an efficient and effective kind of um, service going as we can. So uh, we're, that's our job to try to try to keep costs down, but um, I know there's pressure um, when, we, when you can't find people to do the work as well, so. Charlotte Victoria Park. 
It's a real struggle, and when you when you think of a uh, something like you know children in care of the province, you want to make sure that they're getting as much as they can. So appreciate that. Um, what professional services were provided under housing? Uh, under housing, I th think it was kind of um, <clears throat> some some contracts for uh, repair. So. Um, they do have a combination of, of staff and, and contracted support uh, for uh, housing repairs. Charles and Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And so, and what would be covered by administration under housing? On the administration side. The administration would be related to um, legal legal services for purchasing purchasing properties um, some property tax increases um, would be also in that uh, that area so I, I think there were um, some costs out at um, Queen's Arms there for kind of securing that site for uh, for some of the clients Charlton Victoria Park Thank you, Chair. And are materials, supplies, and services a reflection of higher housing costs, or is it something else? Uh, it was more fuel, fuel costs um, for, for our own buildings. Charles on Victoria Park. I'm good for now, Chair. Thank Charles on Belvedere. I'm good, thank you. Charles. Thank you. Charles on West Royalty. Uh, yeah, just, um, can you just go over a little bit of the increased operational costs supporting clients of the PEI Housing Corp? Can you just go over, like, how, how much was that? I just might have missed that. Oh, just bear with me here. Oh, wrong section. There, I'm gonna start reading that one. I'm totally messed up. Can you be a little more specific on what you're talking oh, about? Charlotte, how much um, I guess uh, oper it says operations costs. This was this was done on October 18th, so that was after Fiona. Um, just wondering uh, about was that in response to Fiona, or you know, was it just increased operation yeah, costs? No, to, to be clear. Uh, this particular special warrant was issued on the 18th of October, was for the fiscal year 21-22, so ended in March. Okay. So as part of um, kind of the conclusion of the public accounts, um, as you recall, the last time we sat, there was a special warrant as well for social development housing. Mm -hmm. So when, um, let's say, the dust settled, when the accounts were finalized, there was further amounts that were required above what was authorized previously by the House. Mm -hmm. So this would be a kind of a settling up of what was actually booked or expensed mm -hmm. for the department for 21-22. Charles, how much royalty? Now, increased operational costs, is that, is, would that, is that maintenance costs? Well, that was uh, fuel, so, um, so additional fuel costs for uh, some of the buildings. Again, we, we provide budgets based on uh, historic value of, of what furnace oil would be and towards the end of last year definitely costs were, were starting to rise. Mm. Charlotte on West Royalty? Yeah, so um, there's an increased uh, increased budget line in social development for next year. Are we going to see this again happen next year or, or is that, are we going to look at this in advance or are we going to look at this after? Yeah, no, the department's uh, kind of reviewing their, their accounts on a, on a regular basis to, uh, to see where they're at. Um, throughout the year and then when they kind of get to a point where they see that they're not going to be able to manage their costs, um, they would be seeking supplementary funding through special warrant if the house is not in session or supplementary appropriation if the house is in session. Charles, how much royalty? Did, did we find the number for, how much was, uh, how much did we under predict on fuel? Under predict, I think it was. Three hundred thousand, I think. Two fifty-one. Two eighty-one. Two eighty-one. Sorry. Sure, I thought it was royalty. 
So that was 281 on fuel, and then that that that's all that was in that line. It's 281,000. In this part of this special warrant was related. They identified as um, an issue or an overspend for sure. Sure, how much royalty? What is the total budget that we spend on fuel? Oh, I don't have that in front of me, for sure. Yeah. No. Charles, how much royalty? There's many departments. You know, housing, DTI would be the biggest. They, they have, you know, fuel oil for moving vehicles and, and buildings as well. So okay. hospitals would have a budget. Yeah. Uh, schools have a big budget. That's massive. So can, can we expect that number to double next year? Uh, how's it, or the, the yeah. price of fuel has gone up. Exponentially, are we looking at two hundred and eighty-one thousand dollars next year? Or are we predicting? How do we? Yeah, um, you know, we passed the spring budget, kind of at the when prices were kind of peaking. So, I, I'd assume that departments factored in some of that cost pressure. And um, you know, we're always hopeful that it's not going to keep at peak amounts all for the whole year. Um, it only seems to peak out when the when the heating season's on. Um, but um, again, that would be part of the department's uh, mm -hmm. budget build for what their kind of outlook for the next year is. Charles, how much royalty? Yeah, and I mean, I, 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 as a critic of social development, I don't, I know th this has to happen. I would rather see us, if we're going to overspend in this, that we actually build some housing or, or do something productive rather than pay. pay. Well, we, we don't have a choice, but I guess that's what I'm looking for that I'd be. Excited about uh, in special warrant over overexpenditures. So I just want to make sure that we 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 look at the books, we look at the predictions, and that if we have to spend in special warrants, that we're actually benefiting the taxpayer in some kind of way for additional services or improvements to living arrangements. Great, thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Transportation and infrastructure to fund additional infrastructure grants and municipal grants, small bridge repairs, <coughs> winter salt and sand, and winter and summer contract services. Total nineteen million two hundred thousand. Charlton Brighton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, if the details show there's uh, over ten million spent on grants, could you tell tell us a little bit more about what what happened? Yeah. Um, Again, I infrastructure is, is part of this, so we're yeah, again no, trying to um, kind of manage the cash flow of, of the projects that we're committed to with with um, with our, our partners and municipal and, and, and private sector or not private sector, sorry, public sector partners. So, Charles and Brighton. So this is not additional project is just different cash flow happening with the yeah. various projects? Um, the way they, there's a fairly large budget in the department for um, for the um, Invest in Canada infrastructure program. Mm -hmm. So again, they would go through a process of, of having a project um, approved, um, a plan sort of cash flow for that. Uh, the department would build their budget based on the planned cash flow as presented by the municipality for say, um, then it would be kind of updating and keep on going as to how fast they're getting the project done. So some years we're underspent, we have been underspent mm -hmm. in the past, this year we were a little bit overspent on, on that particular line. Charlottetown, Brighton. Uh, thank you, I, I understand. Um, so this is this uh, 10 million going to be offset with a federal contribution to that amount eventually? Uh, not, not fully. Yeah. Um, again, yeah. when we're building um, grant lines, um, we have to grant it the federal portion as well. So, yeah. um, so we have our share at the federal share, and then we collect the federal revenue yeah. in the revenue okay. side. Charles, I'm Brighton. Okay, further down on the uh, on the maintenance, um, those extras are they are they just Basic increases in the cost of the same materials, or are we using more materials? Um, definitely, what the information provided by the department. Um, we, we talked a little bit about this in the in the um, capital budget. If the heavy fleet um, and the light fleet, uh, so we would be having some repair bills in there if we can't update them as fast as they would like them. Um, we had. Um, some of our winter salt and sand, um, we had a little bit of disruption in, in 
the yeah, yeah. salt supply there yeah, at one point yeah, in time. Yeah. So we were kind of stockpiling for 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 a while. Um, so there's some of those costs are up. And, and again, there there is another um, uh, portion here for uh, increased fuel fuel costs. Charlotte Brighton. So road and roadside maintenance, there's uh, substantial increases there. What what's the reason for that? I, yeah, I look at the date, and it's sure. not it's not few enough. So, yeah. what is it? Yeah, we, we do have contracts for the winter and summer maintenance that mm -hmm. have fuel components, kind of fuel oh, riders yeah. in them as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so they, they you know the contractors bid a particular price, yeah. and and then as their costs were up, we, we had to fund them a little extra. Sure, I'm right. Oh, just one last question: Where where will the cost for the extra work clearing uh, trees off the road? Well. Where will that appear? Um, yeah, we're we're kind of building a little bit of a claim for mm -hmm. disaster financial assistance. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I think the Department of Justice and Public Safety is organizing those yeah. costs mm -hmm. and Department of Transportation and Infrastructure for some of our own costs. Yeah. Charlotte on Brighton? Uh, I'm good, yeah. Okay. Charlotte on Belvedere? I'm good. My questions for us. Thank you. Okay. Charlotte on West Royalty? Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, you mentioned the, the salt and um, sand, how much was allocated in there to that? You mentioned a, a disruption. Um, so that wasn't inflation, that was a disruption? Well, there was, there was like I said, th this time last year we were kind of uncertain as to where we were going to get salt supplies from. There was a, a strike at one of the salt mines in the Maritimes or a potential labor dispute. So. Um, so we were bulk buying at, at one point in time. Um, so that may not have been the best example, because um, it kind of goes by how much goes on the roads is what the winter kind of looks like. So again, they would have a base budget for what it's going to take to keep the, the, the highway safe yeah. for the winter. That's both sand and salt, so we don't salt everywhere. Uh, we do sand uh, some roads as well. So. Charlottetown, West Royalty. So, how much? How much extra did the disruption cost? Um, For those. I'm, yeah, and, and to be fair, when we we, we buy salt, we, we buy it and stockpile it. Yeah. Um, and we it would expenses, and then at the end of the year there might be an inventory adjustment. So, it, it's really hard. No, it's not hard, but it, it is a little more complicated to see what. The opening inventory was we had a large stockpile come in. What's the closing inventory? And that's what they mentioned labor's disruption. We we're probably buying a little more than we would have normally been buying to stockpile. But if it's sitting in a pile, it's going to get counted as inventory at the end of the year. Mm. Um, but again, it's hard to count a big pile of salt. Mm. Mm. Sure, how much royalty? I'm, I'm just trying to figure out that if if a strike happens again, have we rectified? Is it going to cost taxpayers hundreds of thousand dollars more because we can't get the salt, or have we figured out some other way to keep those costs down? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the commodity only comes from, I think, two places in the Maritimes right now, so um, trucking it is, is another component of it, so when we have to truck it over to us, so the, the rising cost of, of the diesel to, to truck it and the truck costs. But again, this was a relatively small part of the special warrant, the, the okay. a million eight. Special warrant. Charles so, Thomas Royalty? Did you say a million eight? One point eight million, yeah. Charles Thomas Royalty? One point eight eight million seems like a lot for a strike when we're getting the same product we were getting um, before because of a yeah. Anyway. But again, it, it a lot of its usage, right? Um, yeah. So a complicating factor, I guess, more than anything would have been a concern about the supply and, and the potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good discussion. Um, uh, winter and summer contract services, um, were those, were those, did those come in at the end of jobs, like cost overruns, or were the bids just higher? Yeah, no, we, we have a fairly stable kind of supply of contractors that would be providing service to government both summer and winter. Mm -hmm. um, they would have a fuel rider in their contracts, so they get paid a certain amount uh, negotiated, and then a fuel rider as well, so 
um, there probably was a little bit of a, an increase in the, the actual costs and, and a little bit uh, on the fuel for sure. Charlottetown West Royalty? And is that fuel rider, like, is that adjusted regularly? Or are, I'm just trying to yeah. figure out, can it, it yeah, gets... It's adjusted regularly based on the, when the work was performed. Charlottetown West Royalty? Okay, so then you look back and Absolutely. where the gas prices were. Absolutely. And, okay. Um, so those are... But it, in, in, are you are you predicting that that number will increase um, to, to, for contract services in the summer and winter? In, inflation is going up, and it's more difficult to. Uh, are we are we budgeting enough for those contracts? Yeah, um, you know that that's some of the work that the department does on a regular basis is kind of manage those contracts, and um, they're always seeking. New entrants to the field, and, and um, that's the best way to uh, to keep prices low is to have lots of competition mm -hmm. um, and people interested in doing the work. Charlottetown West Royalty. Um, I don't know if I want to ask my next question. It's about the Beach Grove Bridge, but <laughs> I it's the city of Charlottetown I, project. <laughs> well, that's why I was that's why I was going to ask it under municipal grants. Was there was was there a grant provided for that from the, from the province? Would that be under under the special warrant at all? Um, I, I don't know for sure whether yeah. they got a grant for that particular infrastructure project. Yeah. Charlottetown West Royalty? Yeah. These questions are better served for the city, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Charlottetown Brighton? Oh, I just have one question. Uh, your explanation on the grants on infrastructure was, was very good, but it's essentially, whereas uh, fuel is extra money is spent and gone. Uh, this is not really extra expenditure, it's the expenditure that's happening this year instead of next year. So how, how do we know in total, on the to how much of the total appropriation is uh, more money for, that's needed and, and how do you know it's just a cash flow problem? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question because um, you know, the Invest in Canada Infrastructure Program's you know, $367 million, mm -hmm. um, and that's levering some municipal money, it's levering um, uh, some provincial money, um, and it's over a long period of time. So um, we're trying to kind of get projects subscribed to utilize the fund um, and trying to get them done before the last year for the project. So um, that would be... Uh, the challenge is, to, is what will be the final report on that particular um, line of infrastructure grants so that you could see year by year how much got done, I think, would be the best way to kind of sort it out because otherwise you're, you're right. Uh, you know, I may have had a shortfall last year because nothing got done. And this year, you know, a whole bunch of projects were completed that I thought were going to get done last year, but I have to fund this year. Um, but I, I get a budget allotment one year at a time. And it makes it very difficult to have this multi-year and the multi-year projects. Charlton Brighton. Uh, well, I thank you for the explanation. It might be nice to have a, a star next to the numbers that is not really extra expenditure. But thank you, Chair. Okay. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Total special warrants: thirty-six million seven hundred fifty thousand three hundred. Shall it carry? Yeah. Shall Schedule A carry? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we are now moving to page 11, uh, Schedule B. Transportation and infrastructure capital to fund additional expenditures for paving, shoreline protection, bridges, and highways, 18500000 Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Um, in the description you list shoreline protection is one of the items that this is to cover, um, but that isn't in the ordering council that's associated with this um, expenditure. Um, can you indicate how much of that expense went towards shoreline protection? Yeah, no, the minister pointed out that it was, it was 1.8 1. Um, um, and it was related to the breakwater at Surrey. Breakwater in Surrey? Yeah, Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you for that clarification. Just a, the point that, that, that 
the ordering council needs to match the yeah no and I had a discussion with the department on this because when I was trying to do the same reconciliation I think that you were doing um, <laughs> National collectors were a certain amount and bridges were a certain amount and they're having a great internal debate as to whether you classify it as a bridge or part of the national collector if it happens to be underneath the national collector. So um, I've advised them to get their kind of accounting straight because it makes my life a little bit difficult here. <laughs> well, you know, I, sure sure, I, I appreciate that I'm not the only one who went like, yep. wait a minute, that nope. doesn't match. It's, nope. it's, it's, I, uh, it's the same. Okay. Good to know. So, yep. so breakwater sorry falls under national and collector highways, and and you know that kind of it like it after the fact that there's logic in that. Um, okay, so but just specifically that there wasn't anything else. So the remainder of that under the national and collector highways, um, like do you do you get like a list of sort of the projects that that covers? Is is that something that you can share? Yeah, I I the. Yeah, I don't have a specific list of what the plan was versus what the, what the intention is. I, I, I know that between these two categories, and we had mentioned this a little bit at, at capital budget discussion time, um, there was definitely two or three structures that were affected by Fiona okay. that were added to the list and are part of this special warrant as well because they are in the process of getting the work done. Okay. Um, Chair? Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. And that was going to be my next question is, is obviously, I'm going to ask when we've got these, this kind of level of additional expenditure, and it was sort of how much of this is reflected, this is new expenditure because of the, because of Fiona or related expenditures, you know, as opposed to just new projects. Yeah, no, there was, um, the, the information provided by the department was um, definitely the, the cost for paving per kilometer was up this year past yeah. the budget that was kind of voted and, and passed by the house last year um, as well f there were some plans for some fiona repairs uh, i'm not 100 percent certain but I, I believe that our bridges are not necessarily claimable or insurable under our insurance policies and or like whether disaster assistance will uh, We'll provide some of that uh, offset, but um, but again, it was it was definitely re mostly related to uh, Fiona Bridges, uh, the breakwater that got going last year that was not in the plan, but was in the forecast, um, and and as well the cut the cost for uh, inputs for for the paving program. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Yeah, and 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 I can see how that kind of per kilometer cost increase you know over the volume of kilometers that you do are going to have a really significant impact in terms of what was originally budgeted in terms of then and that's a really good example of when a special warrant is actually needed it's for the you know unanticipated cost on projects that have already been committed and then the other example in here is following up um i don't know if you saw that there was actually an announcement of the expansion of the federal funding program through ACOA today an additional 300 million that's going to be going for communities to be able to apply directly so there may be there may be some money coming after all in which case we'll look for a revenue offset but um but um you know bridge i know there were a number of bridges that were impacted as a priority and had to be done as a priority I remember speaking to the the minister about about the impact and, and what that looked like um are you anticipating any any additional special warrants before i mean i know we're only in at this point but uh like that end of your reconciliation with the cost recovery is still going to be a problem. No, I mean, we're, we're coming towards the end of the construction season, so yeah. I would hope that they've got their pricing for the year in and this would reflect what they, on the capital side, there's no more to be done on the road infrastructure between now and the end of March. But, um, you know, the, the department itself has many other facets. It's not just the roads. They have some buildings and they have yep. bridge structures. So. To say there won't be one, I can't guarantee <laughs> that, but uh, Charlotte on Belvedere. I wouldn't make you promise that that would be unfair. Um, however, but then what we would also expect to see is, is potentially um, new projects in the estimates next year as a result of, of project planning, you know, that's longer term as a recovery from Fiona. Um, is, is If there is federal money available for that, will that 
will that just go into general revenue, or are you going to see that as a revenue offset on, on those future expenditures? Yeah, un unfortunately, we, we can't report it as a direct offset. I think right. there's a schedule in the back of the budget book that would try to show the net effect for yeah. the cash flow for the province. Yeah. Um, because again, when we, even though we kind of capitalize and amortize capital projects, we still have to cash flow them. Um, so it's more of a cash flow schedule. Uh, okay. And operating fund would be the answer for sure. Sure, I'll go over there. Yeah, we just know that often that federal money can be promised, but it takes a long time to come through, which is the other the other aspect, right? So cash flow absolutely is a is a, a piece there. Um, I know you've got the loans act coming later for exactly that reason. Um, okay, no, I think um, I think those are all the questions that I had that I was looking for on this one. Thank you. Shall the section carry? General government to fund expenditures related to the emergency support program for Islanders facing. Um, inflationary pressures. Total 15 million. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. So just to confirm, this is for the sales tax credit that was the $140 um, promised uh, that was that was committed to in April and then delivered in July through the CRA. Is that correct? Correct. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Um, so the response and recovery contingency section of the original budget had the 15 million for a COVID contingency and 15 million for a potato industry contingency, but this is funding in addition to those contingencies, which is the result, which is why it's a special warrant. So those other contingency funds still remain with their 15 million commitments in each one. Is that yeah, correct? Yes. Okay. Charlotte and Belvedere. And with these, was this expenditure covered under the, did this come out of the surplus? Like in terms of being able to cover this expense, did that just come out of general revenue? Um, the surplus that was reported for 21-22 is, is just that, a surplus. Um, this is a 22-23 expense, so you could say that we're paying, but again, this is past the allotment that is provided in the budget, so okay. we need additional funding, as additional budget for it. Cheryl on Brighton. Oh, sorry, Charles on Belvedere, sorry. <laughs> Brighton, you're next on the list. Yeah. I'm, I'm good, thank you. Okay, Charles on Brighton. <laughs> I, I just have a question about these checks. Uh, checks always appreciated that, uh, but I've knocked on many seniors' doors. They, they don't know where the check come from. I, I know there were some checks from the provincial government issued by the federal government that was basically not marked. The people getting them had no idea what, what the money was for, whether it was carbon tax refund or whatever. Have you, my question is if you have fixed that issue. I, yeah, I, I, we're working regularly with the federal government to improve the messaging. Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, uh, it's a little bit, particularly if you're getting a direct deposit as well, like that, that's a mm -hmm. further complication yeah. on uh, the money just shows up in your bank account. You may not necessarily know where it come from, but which is a good problem to have. Um, but definitely, um, you know, through the communications that the Department of Finance is trying to do, we're trying to get that messaging out on a regular basis to expect the payment, expect an amount, and these are the kinds of amounts that could be coming. Charles Brighton? Well, I'm sure I'm, I'm like all islanders. I never protest when something is deposited in my account. I'm good, yeah. I'm good. Oh, sorry. Uh, leader of the third party. Was this a separate payment or did it come added on to your GST? Did it come out with DST or was it separate? Yeah, there, there, was, a co there was a number of payments that went out in July. Um, I think you referenced the carbon tax rebate went out in July. Um, this um, inflation payment went out in July. Uh, the low income tax credit went out in July and uh, HST credit probably went out in July as well. Leader of third party. So to your knowledge, were they lumped together or were they all separate checks? Or oh, no, they'd be one amount for sure. One amount, okay. Yeah. Leader of third party. So you have $15 million here. Was that all spent? And was it all spent on uh, help to Islanders or was there some administrative costs in that? What? Yeah, there's no the administrative cost with the program with CRA. Um, that, that's the budget. Um, again, that would be based on the taxpayers that, that we know should be eligible for it. Uh, again, it would be dependent on them filing a tax return um, and having up-to-date tax records, for sure. So, leader of the third party. That's it. Thanks, Chair. Welcome. Shall the section carry? 
general government to fund expenditures related to helping Islanders with financial pressures related to inflation and post-tropical storm Fiona. Total $58 million. Chair, how much royalty? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, yeah, so $58 million, how much of this is going to post-tropical storm Fiona? I think the way the description is, it's to support Islanders with those kind of Fiona inflation, it's, it would be all of Sure, that much royalty? So then what's the breakdown between inflation and the storm? There's not. There's not. Sure, that much royalty? But why would you add post-tropical storm Fiona in? Aren't these inflation payments? I... I I think it was to, to, to recognize all of the hardships that are on the go. And Charles, how much royalty? Yeah, but I, I, I guess that's what just strikes me different, is that, like, I'm looking at the press release that went out on October 31st, and it didn't mention Fiona in the press release at all. And here we've got post-tropical storm Fiona in here, and these are inflation payments. I, I don't... I don't understand. It says in here that um, it, it's because you guys are, you guys did a, a, a great job of managing the money. I mean, it's, it's say that in here, but um, I, I just don't understand why, why post tropical store Fiona is, is in there. These are inflation payments. Um, and I, I bring this up because the Premier said that all of Fiona, all of the Fiona damage is going to be covered by the federal government. Um, that's the, so, I mean, or most of it, or a lot of it is going to be helped on by the federal government. I just don't understand why you would, why you wouldn't just keep it in inflation in your write-up. Again, the, the write-up is, is kind of based on the information that comes, comes from the department describing the, the payment that would be hoping to get authorized. Um, definitely went, went through Treasury Board and through the Executive Council process and then here today I think it was more so to try to kind of resonate with, with the impacts of everything that's on the go, not, not just inflation. There may be you know, some people at certain income thresholds within here that may not feel that they're totally kind of affected or impacted as greatly as some others on, on inflation. So I think um, I don't think there was any ill intent in it. I think it no. was just um, just a description. Sure, that was royalty. No, and that's why I was, I was asking for the breakdown because the post tropical <coughs> storm Fiona relief didn't maybe the the 250 the 500 it didn't cover everybody. Like there's some the word we're definitely missing some gaps, and I thought you might have had. Some some money put aside to to have another separate program, but that's not the case here. Yeah, I I, I believe when the the program was kind of um, costed and developed, they, they again they looked at who would be in any particular band um, of coverage and what that amount would be for them, um, and it turned out to be 58 million for the uh, program that was established. And, and again, I think they were just trying to get some words that would, would resonate with people that may receive the check. Mm -hmm. Carl Thomas Royalty? And hence that's why I was, I was asking the questions because I just saw it in there and I, I didn't know I didn't know what that meant. If if it was all going to help islands with the inflationary period or if there was some there for um, for post tropical storm. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Cheryl Town Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. So to be clear, the previous section we had, the 15 million, was the initial inflationary response. This is the 58 million, which is going to provide either $500 or $1,000 to households that earn less than $100,000. It's going to be paid out mm, in January? January. January, yes, thank you. That little, so, um, And we've done the legislation that we had recently allows you to potentially do uh, future payments, should you wish to do so. Um, do you um, anticipate there being future payments? Like, is there more extra money coming from somewhere that you want to hand out? Not at this time. Not at this time? Charlottetown, yeah. Belvedere? Never say never, I guess. Um, but this is a pretty significant special warrant at a $58 million cost. How did you settle on, on that, being comfortable with that kind of level of expenditure? 
Uh, I think, again, I don't think anybody envisioned like, that the global pressures that we were under would, would have that localized feel. Um, so I guess it was important for us to go as, as far as we could. It does touch about 117,000 Islanders. So I think uh, the rationale was to try to go as, as far into uh, families and that need support as far as we could. Cheryl Town Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I know um, that it's not apples to apples to talk about, you know, the surplus, which, as you pointed out, came from the 2020, you know, the 21, 22. And, um, but the optics of this are that you announce a surplus and then you immediately announce a $58 million mm -hmm. expenditure. So whether or not you intend to, there is very clear connection of we've got extra money, we're going to hand out the extra money. Um, how do you make the decision that you've got the space in your budget or in your, in this case, operational thing, you know, regardless of what you're supposed to do with a surplus, it certainly looks like it's a surplus, therefore we can hand it out. So when did you make the decision that you were going to be going ahead? Was it before you saw the surplus announcement or was it afterwards? I guess it was a continuing conversation again. I think we just kept looking again. The price of fuel has flattened out since then. Obviously, there was some concerns about the severity of the winter that we were facing, and I don't think they've got they've gone down. You know, it is certainly going to be a very significant winter for a lot of families on PEI. So I think the rationale was um, January again, which is always a tough month for some people as they leave the holiday season, so we just felt it was appropriate to kind of soften that that blow. Obviously, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's going to help, but it's, it's certainly, we do have some significant uh, unprecedented inflation to deal with over the coming months. Charlotte Hamble over there. Okay, because I mean, we've had we've had some, you know, so we had questions, including from your own backbench this morning or earlier today about, about how you determine what the, um, uh, eligibility level is, and for most government programs, your eligibility is really low. <laughs> you know, like we have a market, we have a poverty measure set here in the province of uh, a market basket measure, which is about thirty-eight thousand <coughs> for a, a, a family. Some of your programs are twenty thousand, some are twenty-five thousand, but this, but this program is a hundred thousand. Um, I think it's great that that many families are going to get that help because everybody's struggling. But at the same time, why is this program so rich in terms of? the eligibility compared to every other program you do where I don't think you've got a program where the, the eligibility is higher than 50,000 on anything else. It just doesn't make, it, just, it, you're not following your own pattern and I'm just really interested in why you thought that eligibility level was going to be appropriate other than that it gets it to the most possible islanders, which is a good goal, but why wouldn't you do that for other programs too? I guess the short answer can be budgetary. Again, obviously, it, um, this is quite expensive program to do. I think the rationale is just that the price of, of home heating oil has gone so deep into every islander's household that we just, you know, that it, it, was, it was important to reach as far as we can. And that, you know, that direct, any discretionary income for a lot of families would be, you know, evaporated by, by $1,700 uh, oil bills. So again, you know, we, we're trying to soften this blow. We understand it's not. It's not the be-all and end-all, and it's not sustainable, of course, too, as well. So again, um, unprecedented, unprecedented times, um, trying to, to soften those blow, the blow for families. Charlton Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Well, I, I think everybody would agree $58 million is a, is a huge investment, um, but it's not sustainable. You're absolutely right, because it's a one-time cash payment, so it doesn't actually fix anything. What it does is pay for half an oil tank. So, you know, $58 million on heat pumps, $58 million, for instance, on, on paying to get as many houses as possible switched over to electric so they won't have to worry about oil bills anymore. $58 million on just about anything that was a longer-term solution would be a better spend of this money than a one-time cash payment that covers half an oil tank. So I know that everybody who gets it is going to be grateful, but you're not fixing anything. You're just you're handing out free money in an election year, and and it's it's it just seems really at odds with your other stated goals about trying to affect change. Um, so I'm just really wondering about the rationale behind allocating this much money, this in, this huge amount of money. This is more than you've spent on all of your other efficiency programs in the last two years. Um, and I just it just feels like a really weird place, uh, you know, to 
put this much of an investment that doesn't affect sustainable change. Um, so, I, you know, I want to see people get money. I, I, I'm really questioning about the level of, of um, the cutoff when you have the highest possible cutoff is 55,000 for any other program that this government does across all of the programs, and I've looked at every one of them. Um, and it just, it just feels like it's trying to achieve something different than what you're saying it's trying to achieve. So um, I, I would really hope that you are as willing to make this much of a commitment financially when we need to make longer term decisions that actually help islanders. Please, Minister. I'm done. Thank you very much. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Total special warrants, 91,500,000. Shall it carry? Yeah. Shall Schedule B carry? carry? Shall the supplementary estimates carry? Yeah. Mr. Chair, I move that the Speaker take the chair and that the Chair make report to Mr. Speaker. Shall I carry? Carry, Speaker, as chair of the committee of the whole house, I wish to report that the committee has gone into supplementary supply to be granted to His Majesty and has come to certain resolutions thereon, which said resolutions I am directed to report to the house whenever it should, whenever it should be pleased to receive the same. Done. Minister of Finance. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Environment, Environment and Climate Action uh, that the report of the committee be now received. Sir Carey. Carey. Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the committee be now adopted. Sir Carey. Carey. The Honourable Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Environment and Climate Action that the 27th order be now read. Charlotte Carey. Carey. Order 27, Gasoline Tax Act, Bill Number 81, ordered for third reading. The Honourable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, pursuant to Rule 71-1, I move seconded by the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action that the order for third reading of this bill be discharged for the purpose of recommitting the bill to Committee of the Whole House for further consideration. Charlotte Carey. Carey. The Honourable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that this House do now resolve itself into committee of the whole House to take into consideration said bill. Charlotte Carey. Yeah. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow, Government Whip, to chair the committee of the whole House. House, please. <laughs> House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled uh, Bill Number 81, the Gasoline Tax Act. Uh, there's been a request for a stranger to come on the floor. Shall it be granted? 
Uh, while our stranger is coming onto the floor, uh, Minister, do you have a uh, do you have a note that you would like to uh, read? I do. Okay. Before you do that, we'll uh, ask our stranger to say your name and title for answer, please. Ryan Pino, the provincial tax commissioner. Uh, thank you, Ryan, and welcome, uh, Minister. The floor is yours. Uh, we have a slight change amendment to the bill. Bill number 81 is amended in the proposed subse subsection 13-1 by the deletion of the words the investigation and the substitu substitution of the words the inspection. Okay. Um, I believe copies are being passed out to honorable members. I'll give a few uh, moments here just for the... Uh, bring this part to me. That'll get you. So I believe all the members may have a copy now. I'm going to open the floor up to questions. Shall the amendment carry? Yes. Shall the bill carry? Yes. the title uh, bill number 81 the gasoline tax act I move the enacting clause uh, be it enacted by the lieutenant governor in the legislative assembly of the province of Prince Edward Island as follows shall it carry yeah. I move the speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to with amendment shall it carry so we can do this we can do this and then we can and then change over the Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole house, having head under consideration a bill to be intitled Bill Number 81, the Gasoline Tax Act, I beg to uh, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same with amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Yeah. Goes across. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I ask that Motion 132 be now read. Show it carry. Motion 132. The Leader of the Official Opposition moves, seconded by the Member for Mermaid Stratford, the following motion. Whereas Islanders expect their elected officials to protect the systems that are important and critical to their health and well-being. And whereas healthcare on PEI is in crisis due to a shortage of frontline healthcare workers. And whereas healthcare in rural PEI is being especially challenged during this time of crisis. And whereas rural communities should be supported through these challenges not ignored. And whereas the proposed removal of the rural PEI complement of physicians would remove the long-standing protections currently in place to ensure rural health care is supported. And whereas centralization of health care on PEI would be a disservice to all Islanders, especially those living in our many rural communities. And whereas the proposed legislative changes to the Health Services Payment Act <coughs> remove important aspects of human resource planning and distribution across PEI. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to cease centralization of health care on PEI. Therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to retain the Physician Resource Planning Committee and the associated, associated Resource Strategy. And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to review and make any necessary changes to the Health Services Payment Regulations to remove the requirement for all applications to be reviewed and approved by the Physician Resource Planning Committee. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition to start debate. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. With your indulgence, I'd like to recognise a friend of mine in the public gallery this yep. afternoon. Eddie Childs is here and has joined us for, I believe, the first time this sitting. Welcome, Eddie. It's uh, just lovely to have you with us. Um, I, I think I need to start by acknowledging, Mr. Speaker, that when this motion was written last week, I think it was, um, the Health Services Payment Act amendments were on the floor of this House. And the assumption we made, and I think it's a fair assumption, was that a bill that government had spent presumably a long time crafting, consulting with islanders, working its way through the cabinet priorities list, by the time it got to the floor here that they were committed to this. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we felt that we needed to have an opportunity to express our mm -hmm. concerns about the potential implications of such a bill. We heard earlier today that the minister is not now going to be coming forward with this bill. But the fact that this government, although clearly confused or second-guessing itself, I'm really not quite sure what the pathway to the removing it from the, the tabled list that we were going to debate this sitting. I'm not sure what that was. But our concerns remain. Uh, we are consistent, unlike government, we are consistent in our concerns regarding the implications of what the Health Services Payment Act Amendment uh, bill that was before this House and is now no longer before this House uh, what the impact of that was going to be on rural Prince Edward Island. I have always lived in a rural area, whether it was on Prince Edward Island or other places in this world in which I have lived, Mr. Speaker, and I think one of the reasons that I feel so at home here on Prince Edward Island is that the village in which I spent most of my formative years for Troves in the Highlands of Scotland is a small fishing and farming village um, on the east coast of Scotland. And in many respects, you could pick up for Troes, put it down here on Prince Edward Island, and it would not be out of place. The, the architecture may look a little bit odd, but in terms of the character and the personality of the place, um, the rural nature of a farming fishing community, uh, which Fort Troes was and still is, is very reminiscent of many rural communities here on Prince Edward Island. And while each rural community here on PEI is unique, they, they share some common features. There's a tremendous pride in the independence of rural communities here. There's a tremendous sense of community in rural communities, and, I'm, and that goes back generations, of course, to the, uh, the farming and fishing um, traditions and foundations on which all of our rural communities were built. And there's a great vibrancy to our rural communities as well. Rural islanders are, with very good reason, protective of the fabric that, that makes our rural communities so strong. I mentioned, I believe, in uh, uh, was it a question period or a member statement last week, I can't remember exactly, Mr. Speaker, uh, that I had attended and spoken at the South Shore Chamber of Commerce meeting. And a large part of the discussion there was taken up with childcare, the questions that I've brought this afternoon related to Mary Poppins Childcare Centre. But there was also a discussion about the challenges, ongoing challenges that I think almost all rural communities face, whether you're in Prince Edward Island or elsewhere. And that's the maintenance of the critical services that make those communities tick and prevents them from deteriorating and, and becoming less vibrant than they are. And of course, there's a number of services that, that I'm talking about here, schools, and, and we, all, we actually had, I believe, the Minister of Health and Wellness earlier today reference the historic and thankfully overturned efforts to close rural schools in many of our communities here just a few years ago in Belfast and Georgetown and many other places across the province. And I remember as a sole member of the third party at that time, attending some extraordinarily um, uplifting events in those rural communities that really demonstrated how proud they were of their schools and how they recognized that the loss of those schools could be a death blow to their community. We also, you know, retail spaces, things like banks, um, recreational facilities in rural communities, even Local governance itself is, is 
a real essential part of keeping rural communities strong and united and, and, and vibrant. But perhaps above all else, the thing which often creates a, a, a situation from which rural communities do not recover is the loss of healthcare services at a local level. It can be absolutely devastating. And in my own area on the South Shore, the loss of our sole general practitioner several years ago energized that community. It seized the South Shore community in a way that few other threats to loss of services, I think, possibly could. And I remember well the, the community meeting that we had in Crapo Community Hall, where hundreds of people showed up and eventually formed the South Shore Health and Wellness um, Committee that went on to really fight hard um, to maintain access to local primary health care services in that region, and successfully. And we now have two nurse practitioners. We don't have a GP in the area, but we have nurse practitioners providing wonderful health care services to people in a community where we felt threatened that we were going to lose that. So the, the maintenance of health care facilities in rural areas is absolutely critical for the well-being, not only of the people who live there, but of the communities themselves. Rural islanders love their communities, and they want their children and they want their grandchildren to, to continue living there and to reap all the many, many benefits of living in a small and strong community. And rural islanders, when it comes to um, standing up to centralization, which has been a common theme uh, throughout the world. Again, it's not unique to Prince Edward Island, but we see a loss of services in rural areas and a centralization, whether that's in schools or healthcare or retail options, all of the things that, that happen um, in a, an unfortunately uh, a modern, the sort of inevitable what's so-called development in the modern world often leaves small communities and that intimacy, that those less tangible things which make communities so strong and so special, it erodes them. And I, I again, going back to the schools that were threatened to be closed, a school in a rural area is not just a building where kids go from eight to three each day. It's a place where we run community schools all winter. and 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 adults go in there. It's a place where there are craft fairs. It's a place where there are hubs for events and musicals and concerts and community gatherings. Um, you know, a, a building like a school in a rural community is far more than just a building. It's something which brings the community together, bonds the community together, and ensures the long-term well-being of so many places across this island. Now, this government seems to be leaving rural schools alone, and thank you for that. We appreciate it. But they seem to be coming for our primary health care and our hospitals instead. And while we haven't actually seen that articulated overtly, um, it sometimes feels that, that, that the writing is on the wall in that respect. And it's not a pleasant feeling to sit on this side of the house and worry about the continued access in rural Prince Edward Island to, to rural health care. And centralized thinking, of course, is not a new thing. Um, but I do implore this government to remember that more than 50% of islanders live in rural areas. We're the most rural province in this country. And access to primary health care and hospitals, the rural hospitals that we have, are a really essential part of maintaining the vibrancy and the integrity of these communities. This government started by taking away incentives for, for physicians to travel to rural areas. And of course, that had an impact. And we see now, more often than not, that rural hospitals are closed than, than they are open. And that's, that's because, almost always, because of a shortage of healthcare professionals, and one can only, it's, it, it's not rocket science to be able to join up those dots and see that that 
loss of incentives for physicians to travel to rural areas is at least part of the reason for that loss. And now our Minister of Health, who of course lives in a rural community itself, has brought forward this legislation, although it's since been removed, maybe it will be back, who knows, um, which will remove the physician resources strategy and complement that protected our rural communities from having further centralized health care in this province. And this idea of a complement is really important to Prince Edward Island. It legislates that physicians have to be distributed equitably across our island to ensure that all islanders, no matter where you live, have local access to health care. Um, it means that centralized thinkers, big city thinkers, can't come in and hire all the physicians in Charlottetown and make islanders living elsewhere commute there for care. And unfortunately, that's happening more and more. The legislation which was before the floor and has been pulled, but who knows what the future of it lies, um, came to the floor and, and the CEO of, of Health PEI when doing interviews, almost he was almost talking about it as if it had passed here in the House already. It was an odd thing to listen to. Um, and that, I mean, apart from anything else, that's a sort of dangerous precedent to begin with. But it's uh, that's sort of outside what I want to talk about today. I'm, I, I, Bills like this don't just happen. Mm -hmm. you, you, don't, you don't think that you're going to bring forward a bill like this. It takes months to draft it. You put it out for consultation. You run it through your caucus for support, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's been known by this entire government for a long time now. And, and not one of them stood up and said, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something here for my district, the people I represent, that I think proposes a threat to their continued access to health care services. I didn't hear I didn't hear one of them stand up and, and say anything. And this government of course was a, this government of course was elected primarily in rural districts. I look across the floor and the majority of members sitting on that side represent rural districts. So bringing forward a piece of legislation that would that would that would impact negatively the, the communities and the citizens that they represent is, is quite strange, Mr. Speaker. And, I, uh, and health care, I mean, islanders get worked up about a whole lot of things. But perhaps the single most... But perhaps the single thing that they get most worked up about, and it's a perennial number one issue, in, in uh, campaigns and elections is access to health care. It's a service which most energizes um, islanders. So I don't quite understand how this bill ever got as far as it did, right. given the implications that, that it would have for negatively impact. So time and again, we've seen that this government does not stand up for rural islanders mm -hmm. or represent them at the table, but whether that's removing protections for rural health care, whether it is removing protections for our island babies in childcare spaces, Truth. or whether it's allowing our shorelines to be abused in all kinds of ways, this government has not stood up for rural islanders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a, a recent example, we were just, we were just debating the Appropriations Act and uh, all of the money that flowed for Fiona um, to the various communities and to organizations in order to keep, to get our province back on its feet again. And, you know, the whole island was in the dark for many, many of us for two weeks and more. And that was a failure of a private company here on, on Prince Edward Island. And islanders from tip to tip were expressing their frustration that they could not, that they had lost an essential service for an extended period of time and this government was not prepared for such an event, nor did they have a proper plan in place to do anything about it. So what did the, pro what did the Premier do when, when Islanders brought forward their concerns about, about this private company? Did he, did he defend them? Did he come behind those Islanders and say, oh yeah, this is terrible, this is absolutely unacceptable? No, he did not. He spoke up for the company. He said that Islanders were, you know, that this company is good and it's working hard and so on. And, and it wasn't about people, it was about bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And 
that was a real letdown for islanders who were struggling, who were in the dark, who were cold, who did not have services, who were emptying stuff out of their fridges and freezers, and needed a premier to stand there and, and empathize and, and understand the hardships. And what did he do? He defended a company that has a monopoly here on Prince Edward Island. It was a really, it was a, it was a disappointing moment. So I, I know there are many others who would like to speak to this motion today, and I, before I close, I just want to, I just want to talk a little bit more about how this government has descended and backtracked into behaviour and attitudes that are so commonly seen in previous administrations. And I know that the Premier gets very spicy when he's challenged in here and on his being no different from other administrations. He says, oh, I'm not the same old, same old. That's just, it's an indignant cry that we've heard in here many, many times. Mm -hmm. But there's that old adage that your actions speak louder than your words. And, and it's becoming increasingly clear to me, and I believe Islanders, that when it comes to preserving rural Prince, Ed Prince Edward Island, and specifically healthcare services in Prince Edward Island, this, is, this government is very much more of the same old, same old. And I think Islanders are done with that. I think they need a government that is going to stand up for them. I think they need a government that's going to stand firm and represent those Islanders who, whose voices absolutely need to be, whose voices absolutely need to be heard in this legislature. And I look forward to the debate on this motion and for it passing unanimously in this House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank my honourable colleague for bringing this forward, and I'm happy to second it and uh, speak to the motion. Um, Mr. Speaker, if there's one thing I talk about in this legislature, it would be, you know, the need to plan, right? The need to have your backup information and a really solid plan so that we understand where you're going in the future. Um, I could speak about that lots, to be honest, and I seem to have had to do that for many, many, many um, programs that have had a failed rollout from this government. Um, because let's be honest, a failure to plan is going to be a fail. Mm -hmm. um, that's what just, that's what happens when you do knee-jerk decision, um, decisions and you roll out programs without having su sufficient um, planning behind it. So. I can honestly say that I was looking forward to hearing the minister come to the floor with this piece of legislation to try to explain um, why it was going to be so good for Islanders, including his residents that live in his district and all of Islanders uh, across PEI, but especially for rural Islanders, because to be, uh, you know, a uh, an, elected re an elected representative of a rural community and to put forward this legislation, there must have been something that was in it for, that he saw as good for his constituents. I was actually at a memorial walk this weekend and I had, uh, I was speaking to a former RCMP um, officer who was a, the supervisor for the woman who had passed away, the RCMP officer that had passed away, and he said, I always valued her um, because she was a critical thinker and she, she had a lot of insight when it came to decisions. And he said, she always said, and this is Cheryl Duffy, um, she uh, was a resident of, of um, Stratford, but was instrumental in bringing the Stratford Youth Council to um, the area. He said that, you know, she always said that a good decision needed to have three things. It needed to have something for you, something for me, and something for the community. And I've thought about that, and I've said that numerous times over the last three days since, uh, since Lou Robinson said that to me, um, shared that with me. And I would love to be able to ask the minister in this decision to bring forward this legislation, what was in it for him, what was in it for me, but what was in it specifically for his constituents and why was it good for his constituents? I really would have loved him to have brought it to the floor so that he could defend it and to discuss it because it hasn't been talked about in, on this, in this public forum before. Um, 
all across this prob all across this country, we're in a human resource crisis when it comes to health when it comes to health care. And I've heard several times that um, we're the only jurisdiction that has a complement system. Um, so let's remove the complement system because nobody else has it. And we often follow, look to other jurisdictions to see what we should be doing from a legislative perspective. But when you think about it, PEI is the only jurisdiction that has a complement system. Nobody else does. But this is a nationwide problem. That's what the minister keeps telling us. And they don't have a complement system and they still have issues with their rural health care and being able to keep their emergency rooms open and being able to provide family doctors in all those other jurisdictions. So I'm wondering why he wants to follow suit with that. Um, PEI has no, is no exception. We have human, human uh, resource issues when it comes to health care. But what's the most important thing in order to get us out of that is to actually plan and have a strategy to get us out of that. Without that planning, without that strategy, we'll never get out of this um, circling the drain that we're currently in in our healthcare system that is in a system-wide collapse, as many people in leadership would actually tell you. So we need that well-thought-out plan, expert-led plan, from physician resources. So at the end of the day, I think the... Um, I think that the planning committee, the Physician Resource Planning Committee, is actually a good thing, and it has really good value in certain areas. Now, this legislation would have removed that from legislation, um, removed, would have removed needing to have that human resource guarantee, and I'm wondering why the minister would not want to have a human resource plan for the province. He does say that he's going to, that that would go somewhere else, but not in legislation, so he's not going to be the minister forever. Um, the next minister may not keep up that planning wherever it is. That, and that's why you embed things in legislation so that you can ensure that government over government, that you're actually going to have that planning in place. And it was interesting to me that, you know, the, the planning committee, the Physician Resource, Resource Planning Committee was identified as one of the big hindrances to be able to hire because they take so long to do their hiring practice. And what's interesting is their role in the whole hiring process is actually listed in regulations. It's not listed in legislation. So if they wanted to change the fact that the PRPC reviewed every single hiring, they could change that in regulations. There's nothing stopping that. So you wouldn't actually have to have made changes to the legislation. And I will say in the legislation it says, um, an application by a physician shall be referred to the planning committee and shall access it, uh, and which shall assess it, taking into consideration the strategy adopted under Section 2.1. That's in the reg regulations. You could, that could have been changed, and they could have identified in what situations they actually refer to the resource planning committee, the physician resource planning committee, but they didn't. They wanted to scrap it completely. So I don't think that the resource plan, the physician resource planning committee is a bad thing. I think that there's actually really valuable places that you can use it. One example of that would be the neonatologist specialty that brought the NICU to Prince Edward Island. That was a new specialty that we never had before. But that went through the PRPC and they evaluated all the costs and what would have to happen in order for us to, to um, bring that specialist here so that we could have the NICU in, in PEI and at the QEH. I think that was a very valuable um, process that the PRPC went through and it does show the value that they can have. They may not be needed to hire every single physician. You could remove that bureaucracy, that, that step if, if you will, but again, that is in regulations. Um, my colleague has already uh, spoken about the importance of hiring physicians for our rural communities, so I want to talk about that, that real important step of planning. And I'm not so sure that we have seen the justification of removing the complement out, uh, out of the whole process. But again, I wish that maybe he had sat on the floor and he would have defended the decision that he had made to why it was such a good idea and why he put his name to the legislation in the first place. So the minister may say that the physician resource plan is going to be is being made even though he's removing from legislation, but let's be honest. 
everybody has good intentions. Maybe this minister um, believes that whoever comes behind him will maintain that, but there's no guarantee in that. And that's, to me, that's concerning. Legislation lies after the minister um, and after a government. It continues through, and the next um, government has to actually go in and make that change and do it here on the floor of the legislature. And I think that that's an important aspect. So I am calling on the minister to actually deliver an end to end plan of where the systemic issues are within this healthcare system and to give us that plan. There is a situation, there's a thing here that, you know, when we look at the grayness between what's the role of health PEI, what's the role of the board, and what's the role of, um, and what's the role of the minister, nobody else within the healthcare system can bring forward legislation. The minister signed his name to this piece of legislation. And obviously he would have had to gone, go through the planning in order to get him, himself here. But I don't see where they've ever told us how this is good for rural islanders. And that was, that's the biggest concern. The doctors I've spoken to in rural PEI have grave concerns. Even the ones in Charlottetown that I've spoken to, they have grave, con they have grave uh, concerns. So the minister feels like this is good for islanders. He felt good enough to bring forward that legislation in the first place. And you know, for a minister who represents rural Prince Edward Island, I would love to know why he thinks that not having a plan for rural health care um, is actually a good step for him to make as an elected official. Um, and with that, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure there's lots of people, I can hear them chirping, that would like love to speak to this motion. So I will uh, conclude my remarks there and let you move on to somebody else on your list. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Time Alley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think I have another minute. Here. Um, I want to touch on uh, something that uh, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition mentioned, and that was the interview that Dr. Gardam did uh, recently, where he seemed to be acting as if the, oh, yeah, the, he feel frustrated over there, yeah, we feel frustrated over here. seem to be acting as though the um, Health Services Payment Act had already, the, the sure. changes you were making had already passed. And that's completely disrespectful and, and absolutely shows that the minister does not understand his role uh, that he should be taking in leadership of his department. And with that, uh, I will uh, um, close debate. Uh, no, adjourn debate. Adjourn is the language that I would like to use, and I will adjourn the debate. Seconded by Somerset Wilmot. Thank you. Shona Carey. <laughs> the Honourable <laughs> Member from Morrell Dona and the Government House Leader. Debate, debate, keep continuing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill in titulated uh, Bill 130, the Zero Emission Vehicles Act, and I move, seconded by the member from Charlottetown, Winslow, uh, that the same be now received and read a first time. Charlotte Carey. I know that. Right. That's yours. Bill number 130, Zero Emission Vehicle Act, read a first time. Honorable member from Morrell uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this legislation would create a zero emission vehicle mandate in PEI and require government through regulation to create a credit system that requires manufacturers to obtain a set amount of credits by selling a zero emission vehicles or by buying credits from other manufacturers. Uh, annual credits required would be set as a percentage of total sales and rise year over year in regulation, all with the goals of increasing our share of uh, electric vehicles to supply the PEI. The Honourable Member from Royal Dona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm seeking unanimous consent to proceed to second reading of Bill uh, Number 130, which was introduced and read a first time today, very shortly ago. Honourable Members, does a member have unanimous consent? Yes. yes. Honourable Member, you have unanimous consent. Bill number 130, Zero Emission Vehicle Act, read a second time. Morel Dona. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, seconded by the uh, Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action, that <coughs> bill number uh, 130 be. No, that's what I was supposed to write there, right? 
Fred's second time. Shall it carry? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. This House do now resolve itself in the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Charlotte Carey. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. Environment, Energy and Climate Action, uh, we have if one of, if not the most aggressive uh, incentive program in the country. Uh, the second thing we need to do is allow for the appropriate supply of EVs in Prince Edward Island. 
so we need to increase the inventory of new and used EVs and PEI. 75% of all EV registrations in Canada are in BC and Quebec. Lots of you are tired of hearing me say this, but uh, why? It's because they have zero emission vehicle legislation in place. Uh, th this motivates manufacturers to provide dealerships with uh, EVs to earn credits in order to avoid uh, penalties. Uh, we simply do not have the supply of vehicles to meet our emission reduction targets. We need incentives for consumers, but we also need sales targets uh, for the provincial government as a way to increase supply for manufacturers. Uh, I believe that we should emulate the BC and Quebec legislation. I'm sponsoring legislation that will require PEI government to create regulations that include provincial targets for uh, 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 zero emission vehicle sales, compliance ratio for zero um, emission vehicles for manufacturers, a credit system and a reporting system. Uh, the Special Standing Committee on Climate Change recognized the need to electrify transport and PEI. In fact, the very first recommendation of this report is, and I quote, your committee recommends that government introduce legislation to enact a zero emissions vehicle uh, mandate. Uh, in summary, I'd like to create uh, that mandate here in PEI uh, through legislation and regulations uh, that is modeled after Quebec and BC. Uh, medium and large manufacturers of vehicles will be required to obtain a set amount of credits uh, by selling zero emission vehicles or by buying credits from other manufacturers. Annual credits required will be set as a percentage of total sales and would rise year over year. The credit amount per vehicle will be set according to a formula with vehicles that have a greater electric range earning more credits than lower range vehicles. Uh, over 30 countries have EV mandates. Uh, the U.S. doesn't have a, a countrywide one, but they have 13 individual states that do. And we have two provinces in Canada that are leading the way, and they also get the most EVs. I'd like to get ahead of that curve as well. Uh, I believe this type of legislation is a, nece it's a necessity for PEI uh, and to, in order to meet our greenhouse gas emissions, and it'll send a market signal to other jurisdictions, and it'll get more EVs here in PEI. I firmly believe we need this. Thank you, uh, Chair, for allowing me to share that. Okay, thank you, Promoter. Um, so I'll ask uh, if uh, it's the wish of the committee to go uh, clause by clause, section by section, part by part, or open it up to general questions. General questions? Sorry, I heard general questions. So there was a request, uh, request for section by section, so we will go section by section. Um, so we will start with section one, definitions. Are there any questions on definitions? Shall I carry? Here. Oh, uh, no, the preamble's done actually at the end. So yeah, sorry, uh, just for clarity for the members, so the preamble on the, on the first page, on page one, page three, excuse me, is actually debated at the very end of the act. So uh, we're going to move to section two, which is classification of motor vehicles. Any questions? Shall the section carry? Carry. Section three, credits. Uh, social development and housing, Mister. Thank you. Uh, can you just explain, Honorable Member, how the credit system works and, and explain how, I guess, BC and Ontario are doing, just so I can get a better understanding? Yeah. Um, so, uh, in those provinces, the manufacturers uh, uh, have, are given goals by the, the legislation to reach a certain percentage of EVs that are sent to that province in order to be uh, sold there. Um, they uh, put it uh, in their legislation. And what my legislation does is, is it, it uh, asks the, or it holds the government to account to do it, to put that in regulations and to come up with the system uh, by September 30th of, of next year. Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Chair. So I'm still trying to get my head around. So explain how, how government would, would do that. What does it look like, I guess? Like how is it formed? How is the credit system formed? Yeah. So, uh, it's you know it's just they so the 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 manufacturers are like so there's a there's a formula that, that's created and the manufacturers have to meet that so uh, uh, you know, take any type here in PEI any sort of vehicle they have to meet a certain percentage of vehicles that they send to PEI and they earn credits for each one so say you sent a, a fully electric vehicle you would earn uh, say four credits for that this is just like 
this all has to be done in regulation, but I'm just saying what government could do. It's completely up to the department to decide what to do, uh, Honorable uh, Minister. So they would earn, uh, say, four credits for every e EV vehicle that they send. You could, for a plug-in hybrid, earn, uh, you know, say, two credits. So you keep doing that up until uh, you reach the, uh, the percentage that is decided by government at the time. And uh, if they meet that uh, percentage, uh, then everything is good. If they don't meet that percentage, a uh, fine is levied. Minister of Social Development and Housing. So what kind of fine, or is that done in regulations? Yeah. Uh, sorry, is that a promoter? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, if, you know, so, for example, in Quebec and uh, BC, the fines are in the Act. They're upwards of a... Uh, now, this is on the supplier, right? There's nothing on the, the dealers here, for sure. Uh, they're, they're appropriated in the Act. Here, we, we, I, I've pushed that to, re to regulations. Okay, thank you. Minister of Social Development and Housing. So, um, have you talked to any manufacturers on this and, and how it's working in Ontario and BC? Uh, no, I haven't spoken to a, a manufacturer, but I can certainly speak to uh, the data that's coming from uh, BC and Quebec. They uh, certainly lead the way. Like you would, you know, often when I speak to people, they say, uh, you know, well, PEI is just getting their fair share based on population. Right. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, we, we probably are getting it based on our legislation. Uh, but by that uh, route, Ontario would be leading the pack by a lot, and they're simply not. Uh, manufacturers around the world send their EVs, first of all, when they decide when to send them, uh, they, they send it to places that have mandates in place. So if you look at even some of the smaller states in the U.S. that has it, they're getting way more than their percentage share across the country. The same here in, in, uh, in Canada. B.C. leads the way as far as percentage and uh, uh, Quebec is second. And then Ontario was third, as you would expect, because of their large population. So it's, uh, it's an ex, you know, two things, right? Well, one, obviously, helps us meet our climate change goals, which is, which is the whole point, right? As, a, as an assembly, we voted unanimously in, in favor of pretty aggressive climate change goals. So this is the best lever that I see to help tackle the, the transportation part of side kind of thing, right? We've, we've done the incentives, which is really, really important, and now we need to come with a, a mandate that, that helps get more vehicles here. And uh, uh, so, you know, that's kind of the answer. That's how it, it, mm -hmm. it, it's a market signal to, to steer us in the right direction. Yeah. Minister of Social I just Development and Housing. Final question, Chair, in this section, and this might be an unfair question, but do we have oh, sorry. Uh, the physical infrastructure to allow this right now? And the reason I ask, I'm just using my own community in, in Kensington. Uh, we only have one EV charger, that, and there seems to be one vehicle or two vehicles there at all times. Do we have the island infrastructure to accommodate what you're trying to do here? Promoter? Thank you, Chair. Uh, it, it's an, an excellent question. I don't think we have enough of the infrastructure. Now, say, do we have enough infrastructure for, like, where we're going to get to eventually? You know, we need to keep building it. Like, when, if this bill passes, there's no, like, you know, change over tomorrow that all of a sudden we're, we're flooded with electric vehicles, right? We have months of, of regulations and consultation for government to do yet on that process, right? Um, but no, this certainly is a, isn't a, a, a fix. We have a whole bunch of levers that we have to pull as a government, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, th this government has done some of the uh, recommendations from that, that committee report. Uh, this one isn't one that it's done yet, uh, but uh, charging infrastructure is, is definitely one that we need to increase. You and I have you know, we get those same calls from, you know, obviously there's a very small percentage of our population that has EVs right now. Um, our infrastructure is improving. It's not where we need to go. Like, if we didn't improve our infrastructure and then had uh, an influx of EVs, we'd have a problem. But, you know, I've heard certainly the federal government and, and I've heard our provincial government commit to increased infrastructure that we need. It. And, and uh, certainly the uh, fueling stations are also starting to see that too, right? It's, you know, they see... The, the, a shift that's coming, so they'll start adding them as well. Okay. But we have to incentivize them as well to do that. Okay, Sorry, Chair. Just yeah, one social more, development and housing. One more question, and this is it might be an unfair question too, but it's something that is, has been asked to me a few times as of late, um, more on because what we're doing with our heat pump program and, and pushing EV. Do, does Maritime Electric have the physical capability to handle what we're trying to do? If, is Maritime Electric, have you touched base with them just to see if this is a if this is a possibility. Promoter. 
Yeah, promoter. Yeah. yeah uh, thank you, Chair. Just to be clear, there's no unfair questions. I'm sitting here in this <laughs> this chair like you always have to do, so ask away. It's important conversation. Um, no, I haven't personally talked to Maritime Electric, but it, it's I don't want to say you, you missed the book. Yes, we have to do that. I've heard the minister stand up in the legislature. He's been asked questions about that. Do we have the the uh, the, the the current infrastructure to to for the demand that electricity? We're always going to have to keep increasing that. You know, so yes, that we we need that too. As I said, there's a whole bunch of levers that have to happen at the same time. So say we didn't mm -hmm. have this mandate, okay? We're still going to have to increase our, our, our grid. You know, we we our whole our government's goal is to electrify the system. So, like as a as as your government, you you know, we need to electrify the system. So it's, I get what you're saying. Like you know, no, I haven't talked to Maritime Electric. I've been doing it for this bill specifically. But as a government, we need to electrify the, the system because of the other reasons, right? I'm not going to speak no. for the minister here, environment. But you know, we also need to make sure that that's a renewable source that's coming as well, right? We can't keep taking it from non-renewable sources off islands well so that's a that's another debate but your, your point is well taken yes we have to increase our, our, our grid i guess is the the easy answer and, and no i haven't talked to maritime electric about it with respect to this this bill okay i'm good chair honorable thank, thank you. you uh rusco emerald uh, chair so um members you know i'm i'm a big fan of uh, electric vehicles not just because they reduce greenhouse gas emissions but i think they're a great way to to travel with uh they're quiet they've uh, they're less Odor. You don't have to go to gas stations. You can charge at home. I just think they they've got lots of bells and whistles, lower maintenance. Like they're just just a great <coughs> vehicle all the way around. But I I do believe that price is a barrier, um, especially for new vehicles. I mean, in my family, we've purchased two used uh, electric vehicles, and uh, we were able to do that through all EV on the island, which unfortunately closed their location recently. Um, I just I was looking at uh, at section five uh, clause B. So, honourable member, I'm just going to stop for one second. We are going section by section. We are in was section three the, right now. The credits. We're not in the credits and charges. We are. You said five B. The credits and charges section. Yeah. So, sorry, that is section three. Yeah. Is that where we're at? Yeah, we are. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and it talks about reconditioned motor vehicles. I just wanted to understand from you. Um, how this bill will help increase the number of used EVs on the island uh, that can be available to islanders at a you know a lower cost than new vehicles so that we can get more people driving EVs. Promoter, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, th by the the very process of introducing a lot more EVs to, you know, I should say a lot more, in increasing the supply of EVs to PEI. Will then start increasing the supply of used vehicles. Right now, are we going to have a, 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 a influx of used vehicles right away? No, but we need to start now so that we can get those used vehicles on the market in the coming years, kind of thing. Right? Um, y your initial point about about uh, the cost being prohibitive—it's um, an excellent point. And, and you know, uh, you know, I've been watching the prices of EVs uh, like you have, uh, member. And I know that the, you know there's an in, there's a uh, an inflated cost right now because of the demand for them uh, for use for used EVs as well. And uh, um, so, if we had uh, an EV mandate, uh, for example, right across the country, uh, we would then see manufacturers produce uh, EVs quicker and faster. And then also that competition will drive down price. I mean, we already know that every international manufacturer is already committed to EVs already kind of thing. So two things. One, that's how we get the price down. The second, to increase the number of used vehicles, we have to increase the number of, uh, of, of uh, new vehicles as well so that they become used vehicles, if I can use that analogy. Rust Emerald? Yes. Yeah, so I just wanted to be clear. When we're looking at, uh, that B, at 5B and it's talking about reconditioning motor vehicles, does that mean dealers on PEI can bring in used EVs and sell those to accumulate credits towards their EV total and that therefore that will help increase the number of used vehicles on the island? Am I missing something or is that the case? So again we are on section three, we're not on part two, uh, we are in section three but if the promoter would like to answer the question, we are coming to that section uh, honorable member but if the promoter would like to answer that question you're more than welcome to. Confused. Section three like credits is what we're on. 
okay section. With subsections one, two, I, and three. I, I was thought we were going part by part. My apologies, no. sure. But uh, if you want to answer that question, I'd love to. <laughs> don't have to ask it again later. I just want to clarify that you're you're making me second guess it there, but by selling or leasing. So you're asking if if a if a do, will they get credits for used vehicles? Yeah, it Let's sounds like wrong. they do. But yeah. I just want to confirm that, uh, Honorable Member, if I can bring that back to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Rustico Emerald. I still, I do, I, do you have any other questions? Uh, no, that's fine. Sorry. No, thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. Uh, no, promoter? Go no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Member, for bringing this bill. I'm just trying to go through it. It's the first time I'm seeing it, so. Yeah, I understand. Uh, my first question, do you drive an electric car? Uh, no, I drive a, a hybrid. Okay. Uh, Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Um, I guess I, I've been an electric car driver since July, and uh, I, I'm really <laughs> would love to see. I love it. I love the electric car. I wish everyone had had an electric car, and uh, I, I see this as a positive step forward. Um, a few concerns I have with this, and it might be from my experience of actually driving an electric car is. This bill should have come with uh, a mandate for government to have fast charging stations as well with it. I mean, we can, we can increase our electric cars on the island and, uh, and that's fine, but when electric cars only, my experience is when I take my electric car off island, it is, you want to talk about anxiety. That is because the, the infrastructure in the other maritime provinces aren't, I don't even think they're as good as they are here. So with a 460 kilometer range, and that's a range because it fluctuates, um, I can make it to St. John, New Brunswick for an FPT meeting and I get there with 8% battery left. Mm -hmm. So I go to a hotel, the, I check into my hotel, very nice hotel, and they don't have electric car chargers. So I drive around the city to find an electric car charger, which is a 20 minute walk from the hotel, but I found a charger. Uh, my meeting's not over in time, it is over quicker than the, it's just a slow charger so I go on my app try to find some fast chargers on my way home there's one in Salisbury and there's one in Monk we get to Salisbury it's great if you drive a Tesla there's all kinds of Teslas but uh, unfortunately mine's not a Tesla um, the first charger in Salisbury there was a lineup with a lineup quite a substantial lineup so I go to Moncton one in Moncton's out of order. So I just think with this, yeah, I did make it home, I made it to Borden with 7% charge, got my charge in Borden. But I just think with this, we have to have in mandated that the infrastructure is there for electric car chargers. That's just my experience. So I'm also concerned about uh, the car dealerships, I mean, who's, when you talk to the car dealerships, how many, is it just the new car dealerships that deal in new cars, or is it used vehicles as well? Like, where does this mandate stop? Promoter? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of things to address there. <laughs> yeah. uh, first of all, I, I applaud you for your leadership as a minister and, and driving a, an electric car, that's important. Uh, I am jealous of your connections in order to get that electric car. I've had one on order since old, early last, you know, winter, so to speak. Now, granted, I'm looking for a specific kind, so the mean, you know, uh, that's, that's different kind of thing. Uh, uh, that's excellent. Um, I feel like you're making my point. This is exactly why we need mandates, so that it does force governments to bring in and help uh, the private industry with uh, chargers. We do need more chargers, absolutely. And so the more mandates that we have across the country, the more this is going to happen. Um, I'm sorry that, you know, there's there's definitely a, uh, it's a mindset change that we have to have, right? 
I bet you the next time you go to a hotel in Bridgerton, you're going to look for a hotel with a charger. And that the hotel that has a charger is going to get more business because of it. Uh, certainly, I know the, the chair and I were at a hotel on the weekend that had ample electric chargers in the parking lot. Just, you know, random kind of thing. But, you know, you do see that more and often. So the more that, you know, it, you know if we wait, if we, if we don't act and, and, you know, this bill isn't going to all of a sudden influx, you know, thousands and thousands of electric cars into PI where we overwhelm our charging systems. No. Like, I completely appreciate what you're saying, but if we could bring in more EV mandates across the country, we're going to see the demand for that charging infrastructure. And, you know, quite frankly, we, you know, the, in the regulations, you're going to see different goals. We're not looking at a 100% goal next year, right? Like, this is a long process. And as I said, we have to have a whole bunch of levers. This is one avenue. And I appreciate your leading the, the way on it uh, with, with what you're doing. Uh, another lever is certainly improved charging infrastructure. And I don't think, you know, putting a mandate in place now uh, doesn't, you know, prerequisite that we have to have a, 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 ch a charger mandate. That's That has to happen as well kind of thing, right? And so uh, we do have to change our habits, absolutely. As a, as, as you say, like a, we have to plan differently. And uh, two years ago, it was a lot harder for you to take that trip. Um, I, I'm getting sidetracked a little bit. Like that's, I feel like that's a different discussion as well. It's one that we have to have. At, you know, as a province, we have to increase the charging. Um, but right now, you know, we're focusing on bringing more EVs to PEI. But we need to do that in order to meet our climate change goals as well. And transportation is the is the, the biggest bucket of, of where we spend our, our greenhouse gas emissions. We can't stop people driving tomorrow. There's a whole segment of, of vehicles that aren't ready yet, right? And we're hoping by 2035 that they will be ready and electrified. Right now we're looking at that traveling public, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we need to do even do uh, better with our credit system. So what I'm trying to say is there's a whole bunch of levers we have to do. I take your point wholeheartedly that we need a, a better charging infrastructure system as, as well. Minister of Economic Growth, Culture and Tourism. So, thanks for that, and that was a good conversation. Um, just on the dealers, uh, new uh, used car, like we have a lot of dealers on the island, I assume, that just deal in used cars. So are they required to have a, a limit, or is that? No. No. Okay. no. Uh, Minister of uh, Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. So what, what are they saying, the dealerships? Are they... I assume they'd be supportive of it. They, they want as many electric cars as they can get. Is this going to help them get that? Promoter? So I believe it will. When I spoke to the PI Automobile Association, they would prefer increased, uh, increased incentives and better charging infrastructure versus a mandate. Okay. Extend the hour. Extend the hour. There has been a request to extend the hour. No. 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 I've heard no. Uh, the I hour has been called. Do I stand up? Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be in titual, the Bill No. 130, Zero Emission Vehicles Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall I carry? The Honourable Member from Morrell, Donna, and the Government House Leader. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance. This House adjourned until November 30th at uh, 2 o'clock, or 1 o'clock in the PM. Shall I carry? Have a good evening, everyone.